just an Irish problem, the lack of those no. type of footballers being created. Like, is that been led then from the very top of world football, what coaches, what the leading coaches are looking for in terms of athleticism, that if they're not looking for that Modric, Hulahan type of player, then why would underage coaches all the way down try and create that type of player? Well, uh, well, I'll give you my theory on what's happened. Of course, all the, all the top clubs want the creative players, but they don't create them. They come from school by football. And I, know, and I can only talk about England and Ireland. I think what happened is the, 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 the coaches came into being after my time, right, Little Shawl and the coaching badges. And I think uh, you go to Little Shawl and all those places, you get your badges, and a lot of people in school by football, not everybody, because you get good lads, want to be winning coaches. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Yeah, if you're listening on OTB Sports Radio, apologies for cutting off uh, Nathan and John Giles in their prime, but it is with uh, good reason because the Irish team is out and we're going to go live very shortly. Tommy's going to let me know when we're good to go to cross to uh, the Ireland press conference. It is live. Jordan Larmer starts at fullback. It's the big news. Andre Conway on the wing. Live now to Joe Schmidt for the Ireland press conference. Larmer at fullback. The replacements are Noel Scannell. Dave Kilcoyne, Andrew Porter, Ty Byrne, Jack Conan, and the backs are uh, Luke McGrath, Jack Carty, and Chris Farrell. Joe, I just get your thoughts on the selection. I mean, with the, the players injured in, in, in the backs, particularly, was it the case of the team kind of picking itself? Um, and not really. Uh, you'll see Joey will run fully uh, in the warm-up just as a, as a reserve back. He's trained really well this week. I think Keith Hills was the, was the sharpest player at training um, on Wednesday. Uh, certainly hit the best time, was very, very sharp. So, you know, he's good. Rob Carney uh, trained well as well. So it was really just that we were getting very tight for time and uh, the best content Continuity we had, we felt, was was to to have the guys who trained through the through the time that we've been here. So that's uh, that's what we went with, and you know, and it's exciting to have the back three that we've got as well. It's a it's a great opportunity and a, a fantastic challenge for them. For uh, Jordan and Andrew, what can they bring to Ireland? And was there any question mark in your mind of who played fullback and who played on the wing? Not really, no. Um, yeah, I, I think that their their enthusiasm is, is something that's contagious. I think their uh, ability to get themselves into the game. Um, I, I think Andrew has proven he's, he's got real aerial ability and uh, that will be really useful for us. Um, I, I still have the, the vision in my mind clearly of Jordan Lama beating Israel Folau to a ball in the, um, in the third test in Sydney on the, our Australian tour in the middle of last year. So... Um, you know, he, he's very good there as well. And Jacob, of, of course, is a, is a big man in the backfield. So, you know, th there's that. Um, they're all feeding off each other. They're all young men who, who are very, very keen to impress. So, really, I, I, I guess they've, they've now got that opportunity. Sure, there seems to be a uh, word going around that if the day rains, uh, it might suit Ireland better than Scotland. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess. Um, you know, you just have to adapt to the conditions. I'm pretty sure that they will adapt as well. You know, if uh, if Greg Laidlaw's at scrum half, he's a very proficient kicker. He's a very effective goal kicker as well. And I think, you know, when it when it does rain, points become just that little bit more valuable because they're harder to get because it's harder to sustain a continuity of play. Therefore, uh, Greg Laidlaw could be very useful for them. And we know Finn Russell has a, a huge variety of kicking game. So uh, he will be a threat, and and there's the length of Stuart Hogg's kicking game. He's got a very long kicking game. So I, I think in, in the end, um, when you match that up with us, uh, with with the likes of Connor Murray and and Jonathan Sexton, um, I don't think there's too much between the teams, wet or dry. Rory, in terms of humidity and the conditions, how do you think that'll affect things in terms physically and even ball handling and road? Uh, yeah, look, I think, like Joe said, we, we have to, to adapt. We've been here for um, a good few days now. We've trained in, in some rain. We've trained in, in a lot of, in a bit of heat. Um, so, yeah, look, we've got used to it. We've, we've trained 
with various bits and pieces over the summer, whether it was in Portugal or at home. Um, and look, we've geared ourselves up. We, we knew what the potential conditions would be, and, and I think we're in a we're in a good place for that. Ultimately, I think the the acid test will be Sunday. You know, you can put in. You can put whatever you want in the ball. You can put whatever you want in training. But ultimately, when you get to the game and the pressures of that, um, it'll be about making sure that, that you can can stay focused on what you need to do. So I don't know if you've seen the surface uh, game the night before. How do you think it's going to stand the test? Yeah, I, I haven't seen the surface since we since we had a look here some months ago. Um, so whatever the surface is, we'll have to cope with. Um, if it has been chewed up a bit by um, by the All Blacks and the Springbok, it's a pretty big game, some pretty big men running around. Uh, but I've no doubt one of the things that has impressed me is is how quickly they can they can turn around a manicured surface. Uh, we trained in Etihara there, um, and they they very quickly turn it around and uh, and make sure that it was that it was in tip top shape each time. So you know the the surface was. Um, was good here. The two games we played in Ajinomoto and uh, and Okopa Stadium last time we were here in, in two seventeen in the summer of two seventeen. So, you know, we would anticipate a, a very good surface, e- even if it is a little bit wet. Joe, obviously you've been building to this game for a while. Um, at the end of last year, Johnny had said, "It was a great year. You guys haven't peaked yet. Um, are you ready to beat now? Um, you, you've just got to hope so." You know, I can't guarantee anything um, in 20, in 48 hours time, uh, we'll have a better idea. We'll be, um, we'll be just, uh, you know, arriving at the stadium and getting ready to warm up and I'll be anxious. Um, you know, some of you people, you know, you've been great supporters of ours and, and you'll be anxious as well because you, you never quite know. But one thing I, I will be really confident of is that, that we will be tough to beat. Um, that uh, in 48 hours' time, uh, I think you'll see a, a very, um, you know, a very collective effort, and um, that that effort will, will make us tough to beat. Now, I've no doubt that the Scots are are, are working away and, and going to make sure that they are something similar. Um, I don't think there's a huge amount between the two teams, and so whoever does maybe get the bounce of the ball or, or can be just a little bit more efficient than the other. Um, it, it may just tip the balance. And have you um, got a little bit still up your sleeve? Um, yeah, short sleeves, <laughs> not too much up my sleeves. Uh, I, I, again, you know, there's there's certainly things that you that you do hold back a bit. I've no doubt we'll see something from Scotland that we haven't seen before because um, you know we've we've been planning this for a long time. Um, and and when you get the the opportunity to put it into practice, uh, it, it still has to be put into practice accurately. And uh, one of the things that gets in the way of that is the amount of pressure the opposition can put on you. And I've no doubt that both teams will be trying to put pressure on each other so that whatever they have got planned isn't quite as effective as that hope. So what was the most difficult selections for you and the coaches that you had to make? Um. Well, they started in the summer and, and they've worked their way all the way through, you know, going from 45 to that 45 to 31 and now and now to 15 to start and, and the bench. I think one of the things that made it easier in the backs was that there are backs who've trained all week and there are backs who are now fully fit and up and running and, and we just felt that for continuity's sake, we would we would also show the amount of faith we had we have in the squad. And um, up front, there were, there were some tight tight decisions as well. Um, we've been really happy with some of the guys who've come off the bench for us. And, uh, you know, if they can continue to do what they're doing, it, you know, whether a player starts or comes off the bench, they are every bit as important to us uh, because you know that in the last quarter of the match, that's, you know, if the teams are close, that's that's pivotal. And we need the right people coming off the bench doing the right job. So, um, I yeah, I think across the board, I, I think we're happy with uh, the starting 15 and the bench, and you know, we'd be happy to supplant some of those guys um, with some of the guys who aren't there, but um, that's that's what you've got to be confident of when you've got a squad of 31. You've got to be confident of all 31 of them. Okay, last question in this well, section. 
Yeah, um, Blind didn't make it obviously this week. Um, what's your how have you broken down how you pick your second rows and what's what's the thing? Is it because there's another big game in six days' time or what's the what's the thing the call process? Yeah, I, again, there, there, that was a, a relatively long discussion. I think um, you know James Ryan has come back in for these last two games and, and done really well. Um, he's of known value to us. You know, in Henderson's almost got 50 caps. That experience, uh, uh, he, he was involved in the big games uh, in the World Cup last time. I, I think to have that experience is really important, particularly in the first game out. So uh, for, for Jean um, to kind of find his way um, into the tournament, I, I've no doubt that he'll feature in, in, in some really important games for us. Um, coming off the bench, Ty Byrne, he has ability to change the game up a little bit. So, so we felt probably his versatility across the whole back five, um, specifically in the second row for us, because we've uh, we've obviously got Jack Conan on the bench as well. But I, I, we do feel like he gets great pressure on the ball. He uh, he has uh, a little bit more time with us than John has had. So. We just kind of felt for continuity again. We we would go with that with that combination. Okay, we will switch now into the embargo uh, written word. Yeah, that's uh, the fairly brief thoughts of Joe Smith after naming his Ireland team to take on Scotland at Rugby World Cup opener this Sunday morning. As you can see, joined uh, on this Friday morning. Like what we replace one very passionate. Uh, Intercounty GA football supporter with his team that generally get laid deep into the championship. Don't ever really quite get over the line with another one. Nathan, good morning to you. Wow. Harsh. The uh, team, we'll come back to a bit more. A bit more abusive sure mail. Over the course of the, uh, fine. Of, of the morning. That'd be good morning, much, Adrian. Very much amongst the plan. Great to be here. Bright and early, 7 o'clock, live, exclusive Ireland team naming. Okay, Jim, calm it now for a second. Okay. Let's Buzzing. bring our uh, viewers the uh, team this morning because we had to get straight into Josh Schmidt there at the very top of that. So just a reminder of the Ireland team to take on Scotland at fullback. It's Jordan Larmer gets the start there. It'll be just his fifth ever uh, start at fullback in an Ireland jersey. On the wings, Andrew Conway uh, on one wing and Jacob Stockdale on the other. Uh, he's gone for the combination of Gary Ringrose and Bundy Aki in midfield with Johnny Sexton and Conor Murray in the halfback positions. Uh, the front row, Keen Healy, Rory Best and Tyke Furlong. Ian Henderson will join James Ryan in the second row. And the back row is Josh van der Flaer, uh, CJ Stander and Peter O'Mahony. So that's how the uh, back row Stacks up, a bit of an opportunity obviously there for uh, van der Flyer as well. And on the bench will be Niall Scandal, Dave Kilcoyne, Andrew Porter, Tyke Byrne, Jack Conan, Luke McGrath, Jack Carty and Chris Farrell. So that is the match day 23. The big news obviously is the uh, start at fullback for Larmer and Conway on the uh, right wing. There was a lot of discussion during the mm. week, had, had them in the opposite direction. Um, it didn't come up in the press conference, but you suspect that actually over the course of the game, they will be quite uh, interchangeable. You'd imagine so, and all the speculation was that Andrew Conway would start at 15. You mentioned like Jordan Larmer's played four games at international level, mm. one of them in the Six Nations. How Joe Schmidt has ended up in this position where Jordan Larmer starting the biggest game of his tenure against Scotland at fullback with that little level of experience. And the very fact he went with Robbie Henshaw at fullback in that experiment against England would suggest that he hasn't been fully convinced of Jordan Larmer. It's certainly not the team that Joe Smith would have wanted starting his first game of a World Cup. That back three have never played together. It does re-emphasise, I think, that for all the talk and all these press conferences over the last week, Joe Schmidt doesn't play players unless they're training mm. for the full week of the match. They spent all week talking up Earls, Carney, said there that Keith Earls was the best player in training, went mm. better than anybody in training on Wednesday, yet isn't ready to start a game four days later. Ultimately, the decision was made that if you hadn't played a part in every training session since they arrived in Japan, you weren't going to play. Now, you can understand, there's no point taking risks and Keith Earls picks up another knock and suddenly you uh, miss the tournament. But it's strange how this game has suddenly come upon us. I feel we've had this obsession over the last two or three weeks about South Africa for many reasons, with a lot of the doping conversation, but also the fact that they've turned their form around that we are very much focused on a World Cup quarterfinal, potentially against South Africa. And are we just treating the Scots a little bit lightly? 
Um, I mean, there's always a disparity between what we're thinking, I suppose, and what the uh, squad will be mm. thinking. And um, you'd be absolutely certain that they're uh, that they're not. We've had a fairly decent record against them over the last couple of years. They're going to name their team, it seems, in about three hours' time or thereabouts. Um, but uh, you would be concerned. The concern for me against uh, the Scotland team would be the quality of their uh, ten and fullback positions, and they are very much a team that uh, subscribe to that sort of dual playmaker mm. role. And uh, there was a, a, a wry smile from what I understand from one of the Scottish squad yesterday when they were asked about the possibility that Rob Kearney wouldn't be starting a fullback and whether that might factor into their plans like of bloody course it will mm. and that's maybe the slight surprise for me about that Ar- Ireland team selection that Conway you would think despite having only two starts of fullback versus Larmer's four is actually the safer option and particularly given the conditions that we're pretty sure are going to be there it's not doesn't seem as if it's going to be the typhoon conditions that we might have once expected but there will be winds it appears certainly the forecast at this point and there will be rain as well and uh, like actually in some ways despite all the conversations about Rob Kearney over the last four years this if you were blood, if if you knew the conditions that we're going to be facing in our tough, what what looks to be our toughest rugby mm. world cup pool game, you would blood a player exactly like Rob Carney to be able to fill that uh, fill that position for you. So it's incredibly unfortunate that he was absolutely cut out for this game and for these conditions, and, and he now won't make it. Um, so and that's maybe the surprise. But you will see Larmer's going to get absolutely bombed all day with uh, with high ball. You absolutely assume that it it'll be interesting too, and we'll talk to. Uh, Owen is going to be on the line uh, for us very shortly after the main press conference in Yokohama. We're going to talk to Alan Quinlan a bit later on. We're going to talk to Brendan Mackin as well, who's the former Leinster centre, uh, who would have been a teammate of Andrew uh, Conway as well. We can get his thoughts on all of this. Uh, it might also dictate some of um, Ireland's uh, play in mm. this game. Like, do we kick into the backfield in a way that we might have done before on the basis that actually you might get that ball back at you doubly quick in the air and windy, condi- windy and wet conditions? Might not be the might not be the safest of plays. No, like it's a very exciting looking back three from Ireland all of a sudden. When we have the ball. When I'm we have the ball. excited about it. Everybody, but it just feels so anti-everything Joe Smith is about with Ireland, where it's played as safe as possible. And there's never really been any question that Rob Kearney, for all the unwarranted criticism he receives over the years, mm-hmm. like at a World Cup, first and foremost, you don't want to make mistakes. And you do look at that back line and feel it lacks some ballast. Even with Gary Ringrose getting the selection ahead of Chris Farrell and like, it seems sh- strange to even be discussing that that like, Gary Ringrose is this wonder boy of Irish mm. rugby but has had a dip in form but a sense that actually what Joe Schmidt wants in the centre is two big powerful men it is an Irish team that could play a lot of very attractive rugby you just wonder is it an Irish team that's been prepared to play attractive rugby those players individually can do it but are they going to be allowed to play to that skill set or are they playing to a game plan that was very much built around having Rob Carney, Keith Earls and Robbie Henshaw Mm. and does that suit them? Now, one of the things with World Cups and you'll read this in a lot of the previews is they do take on a bit of a life of their own. Players come Mm. alive and in a decade's time we could be talking to Andrew Conway about that two months in Japan where his career changed forever and how did he never repeat that form? That something just happens. But you do think... And it wouldn't be at all surprising, I think, for Conway and Larmer to start three of the four pool games, but not start the World Cup quarterfinal, regardless of injuries. That actually, Rob Carney and Keith Earls may just play that one game against Japan and not be seen again until a World Cup quarterfinal. If, if I were Josh Smith, that's what I. If if I was dealing with a full deck at that point, and frequently, mm. obviously, there are a bunch of factors. One stat I saw yesterday about the number of games that the starting fifteen in Rugby World Cup finals over the last maybe six, the number of games that that exact 15 had played together was one. Right. So, i.e., there will be changes and plenty of changes that you won't expect or won't be able to plan for. But if I'm Josh Smith, at this juncture, right, I mean, because you could argue, now, this isn't by way of getting ahead of ourselves in any way, shape or form, but you could argue that we're not going to get overly tested in the pool. That's not something we've overly discussed or overly um, mm. thought about too much up to this point. You can be absolutely certain that the squad aren't thinking it, but it is possible. Oh. So how much stock you put into the fact that Jordan Larmer goes out and has the game of his life, even on uh, on Sunday morning or even against Japan, how much actual weight you put behind that in terms of picking a quarter-final team, I would think uh, I would think if Rob Kearney's fit, I'm putting him back in. Again, you're not underestimating the Scots there. That actually... There is an opportunity here for Jordan Larmer. This isn't a game against Russia or even a game against Japan. That for Jordan Larmer and Andrew Conway, they're going out a World Cup opener 
the biggest game of the pool against Scotland, very much a tier one nation, that if you can go and perform at this level, maybe you can put something in Joe Schmidt's mind. Now, I, I think we all feel it's unlikely, mm. but if Larmer goes out and has the game of his life... I think the difficulty is that if it's a dream pool, mm. right? Like, we, we've talked ourselves around to the fact that Scotland are going to be tough, of course they are, and I've certainly heard in some quarters that Japan are going to put up a bit of a stiff test to us, particularly the team that we saw before the last two warm-up games against Wales, that actually we, this could be a stiffer test than we'd ever really expected it to be. But it is a dream pool in so many ways. And I think that if we had the likes of a South Africa or New Zealand in that pool and Jordan Lammer had gone out and had an absolute whirly against them, then at that point you're saying, well, actually, this guy deserves the jersey. Mm. But in some ways, and it's difficult for him, he is on a little bit of a hiding to nothing against Scotland because if he goes out and has a great game and we beat them 7, 10 points, it's like, grand, well, sure, that was just really what was expected. Like, it's difficult for him to make a mark against those teams in that pool. You can absolutely see a situation that if Ireland don't win a quarter final that we're talking about, were Ireland undercooked? Mm. Did the players play enough game in the weeks leading up that essentially after the Scotland game, and with respect to Japan, that they had this sort of three-week break where other teams are coming in a little bit more ready? Yeah. Having a quick look through the starting 15 and going through previous Joe Schmidt sides, this 15 never played together, but 14 of the 15 actually played in the Six Nations win against France right. this season. The only change is Conway in for Earls. Larmer started full back in that game. The rest of the team is the exact same. It was Ringrose and Aki in the centre. So it's not that different because no. part of my thinking when I saw the team first was like, how did Joe Schmidt end up in this position? Having had four years to prepare, having had the entire cycle, whereby Andrew Conway and Jordan Larmer both playing the biggest game of their careers. Now, that when we lost England in that first game of the Six Nations, that suddenly all these players weren't given more game time. But then you look, actually, did it all start pretty much against mm. the French? It's still, I don't know, it feels like an underwhelming starting 15. And I knew it was coming. I, I particularly look at that back row and think, she's Sean O'Brien and Jamie Heaslip. Mm. You had one of, if not the best, back rows in the world. And right now with CJ Sanders form, you're looking at that back row and thinking... Pfft. He's probably one of, outside of all the injuries and all that stuff, he's probably one of the most fortunate players mm. to have been in that team. And it had been a huge suggestion over the last few days that that was the way it was going to go. But I think Jack Conan can feel um, somewhat aggrieved that he hasn't got the nod here. Um, and there'll be huge pressure on CJ Stander. I'm sure the Scots are looking at that selection and saying, listen, we have done a number on this guy before in terms of CJ Stander. And he ain't in form at the minute. Probably had a, one of his best games of late against Wales the last day out. And it, there will be a huge, I think, momentum uh, behind Ireland from that game as well. Do you know what? Like, we can go out on Sunday and get beaten by Scotland and it's not actually going to make a huge difference one way or the other because we're not even setting our own minds about whether we're better off playing New Zealand or South Africa mm -hmm. in the quarterfinals. So the, it, the, it, the, the reality is, right, despite the planning that you've, you've spoken about, right, and the depth that Joe Schmidt, uh, his state at AIM, has been over the last mm -hmm. years to create that depth, despite all of that, we could go to a World Cup, beat uh, Japan, Samoa and Russia, get beaten and there'd be no, you couldn't have any qualms about it by by one of the teams that may go on to win the World Cup in the quarterfinals, and that's the end of it. It's, you know, like we could get beat by Scotland, get into a quarterfinal against one or the other of those and make a great uh, difference one way or the other, and suddenly you're out, and that's the end of it. And it's like all the planning that's got on for the last... What's your point? Years. My point is that, like, you can... What's you the can, point of it all? Yeah, I mean, there is an element of that, but look, I mean, that's the doomsday scenario. Um, yeah, I, I, I... And here, there'll be so much spin either way from Scotland or Ireland, and because of the way the weekend works out, and like that All Black South Africa game is the game everyone's going to want to watch at the weekend, mm -hmm. that you can flip it if South Africa beat New Zealand and Scotland beat Ireland, you're going, well, all along we thought South Africa was the team we might end up playing in a quarterfinal, and it's happened that way. It just feels that after the Six Nations that's happened, the performance at Twickenham, if you were to lose to Scotland, the doubts that are there, yeah. as good a coach as Joe Schmidt is, to be able to turn that around in the space of, I think that's hugely valid, of a few yeah. weeks, yeah. you would imagine to be, like the negativity to be surrounding well, like, the squad the, the, be, That momentum that I mentioned there and whatever sort of carryover they would have got from that into the World Cup, for me, that's the reason to beat Scotland as much as anything else, mm. right? Like the sort of maintaining that because if that bubble gets burst at that point, everybody's questioning themselves. And well, the flip of that, I think, is that actually, if you go and beat Scotland and if you could mm. put in a solid, convincing all-round performance, everything that's gone before this year is forgotten about. Mm. It's, they've got to a World Cup mm. and players have delivered. Yeah.
Uh, do keep your comments coming into us. We're going to hear from uh, Tyg Furlong very shortly. Stay tuned for that. He's going to be in front of the media, including our own own Chehan, uh, very shortly. So stay tuned for that. The Rugby World Cup does begin this morning. It's uh, underway in four hours, 23 minutes and 17 seconds uh, when Japan take on Russia. That uh, game, of course, in our pool. And um, there'll be plenty of reaction to that, I'm sure, over the weekend. Here's a bit of a flavour of what's coming up for you on the show this morning. But myself and Nathan, we're going to uh, continue to pick through that Ireland 15. We'll be crossing to own uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes' time or thereabouts. We're going to talk to Alan Quinlan as well, just before Ed talk to get his reaction to this Ireland selection for the Rugby World Cup opener against Scotland on Sunday morning. Uh, we'll tell you what's happening in the sports pages as well very shortly. I mentioned Brendan Mackin, he's a former Leinster centre. Uh, and would have played along the likes of, uh, alongside the likes of Andrew uh, Conway, so we'll get his thoughts. I'm sure he'll have some interesting stuff to say about that <clears throat> midfield selection, uh, as well as everything else. Kevin Caban along to, to uh, reflect on the week's European action as well, to look forward to a pretty uh, interesting weekend in the Premier League. We'll have uh, live commentary of that Liverpool-Chelsea game on Sunday as well with Nathan and Brian Kerr, so we'll get Kevin's thoughts on all of that. Phil Thompson too, uh, we'll look ahead to that exact game uh, for you at about a quarter to nine. We're going to talk about uh, whatever else is happening in the world. It's very much dominated by that Irish team this morning, but whatever else is happening in the world just after nine o'clock in the company of Phil Egan. So that's pretty much what's uh, coming your way over the next while. Well, we're going to hear from... Uh, Tag for long very shortly, but we're going to take an hour break now. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Sport Ireland Campus Blanchard's Town is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you in the community. Check out our amazing offers for families with kids' camps, sport academies, and birthday parties. Or for adults, why not join our gym with a 50 meter pool or your club? School. Friends can book one of our world-class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our athletics track, soccer, basketball or badminton courts, and many more. Check us out on sportirelandcampus.ie. Join Bruce Betting now for a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. That's right. New Irish accounts can enjoy a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. So if your first bet loses, we'll refund your stake with a free bet. Now that's giving you more. Bruce Betting, in store, online, and now on your phone. T's and C's apply. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. OTB AM. Right, back to Yokohama. James Ryan and Tyg Furlong talking to the press. I suppose I'm not all that experienced either. I've only ever played one World Cup match myself. So, um, you know, I think it's just try to stick to, you know, what we've worked on, you know, throughout the pre-season and, into the warm-up games and, um, you know, you're not reinventing the wheel. You're just trying to, you know, do your job as best you can, really, and um, try to block out as much external noise and distraction as you can so you can just really focus on your performance. How excited are you for that atmosphere in the stadium, the anthems, just knowing you're at a World Cup and for all the Irish fans who are going to make the first match for now? Yeah, I suppose, look, there's two parts to the answer that question really isn't it and, you know as a player um, I suppose you build up for a World Cup for so long and especially after you know a, a small involvement that I had in the last one but you're still uh, I suppose looking forward to holding on to a bit of the disappointment that you did feel after that quarter final in Cardiff um, the other side of that is you know the Irish um, support uh, we have over here and it's Incredible in a way, no matter where we play, you know, home or away, summer tours down in Australia, South Africa, um, you know, uh, over in Chicago twice, you know, the amount of people that travel and, you know, I know for myself, people back home traveling, you know, it's, it's, it's a big expense to them, you know, it's um, a lot of money on the line, a lot of time off to take with the travel and stuff, so I, de- I definitely don't think that's lost on the players. Last question for you both. What's your earliest World Cup memory and how does that set out the eye of the sense of what this tournament means to people? Um, for me, uh, probably the one that came to mind quickest there uh, was the Australia Irish game in 2011 uh, when uh, obviously Ireland had a, had a big result there. Um, you know, I remember Stephen Ferris picking up, picking up Gany at the time and I think kind of a seminal moment of the game. Um, so, uh, I think for me that was a uh, kind of a big memory. I was lucky enough to be at the World Cup in 2007 as well, um, to be there, kind of experience, um, you know, to 
just the, the amazing kind of occasion that it is. Uh, obviously, it didn't go too well that year, but um, for those two, would be which to get me. Yeah, I think I think 2000. And what you year 2011? You said was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think 2007 for me. Um, or would have been what 15. Um, so I remember catching those games. No, you don't. You don't really. One moment probably doesn't stick out, but you know, you remember, you know, that age in school and watching with your friends and stuff like that. It's kind of mad to think that Roy Best was playing this. That's the first one I can, you know, distinctly remember in some ways. But um, it probably just shows the longevity. Is probably a nice way to put it about him, isn't it? So of his career. Yeah, how do you enjoy playing alongside Ian Henderson, and how do you complement each other in that? Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy playing alongside Hendy. Um, you know, he's he's a real smart player, um, and he, I think he kind of, alongside that, he, he's really physical. And um, you know, when, when he's going forward, um, you know, he's such a big man. I think everybody follows in a way. Um, obviously, in terms of line out, I think again he's really intelligent there, and we kind of, kind of Hendy, Pete, and myself, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of. Hopefully, share the responsibility a bit in that area, um, and if Peter and myself, you know, see opportunities um, in the line, you know, we'll feed that back to him. Um, but you know, as I said, I really enjoy playing alongside him. He's a super player. Uh, guys, question for you both. Joe was just talking about um, how something will work game straight up against your one nation. How do you guys cope with that intensity and the build up? Um. Yeah, I suppose to build up the pressure and all that, you know, at this level we're professional athletes and, you know, we've got to be ready for that and mentally kind of prime, prime to go. Um, for us, the focus this week is, is just bringing the best version of ourselves. Um, you look at Scotland, some of the quality they have, you know, whether they go with Ben Russell or, or Hastings at 10 and you combine that with some of the threats they have in the, in the outside back area, uh, you know, Hogg, Seymour, Darcy Gray and Maitland, you know, some of the quickest and most rapid guys in world rugby. So I think when you put those two together, um, you know, they're seriously put inside. So for us, um, you know, we, we just got to be absolutely bang on uh, this week and I think ready to go really from from the, from the word get-go. So I've obviously had a good, um, you know, very cool program, but obviously can't go to the end. Um, do you feel like you're you know, ready to sort of play the straps now? Yeah, back to best. Uh, yeah, look, I think, you know, we had the four warm-up games. and um, I thought throughout we probably got better and better as it went on. And I suppose it's something, if you think about, you know, a World Cup warm-up where you, you go through a lot of work, you know, the S&C is tailored in such a way to hit your straps at a certain point, etc. And, um you know, when you, you play a game, there's no sort of easing in, into it, is there? And it would, not that we intentionally thought that going out against England, maybe, but, um, you know, you probably hit you a realisation where the standard's at. You know, I think we bounced pretty well off the back of that. And, you know, to win in Cardiff is not easy. Uh, to beat Wales at home is not easy. So, you know, I think there's definitely confidence grew within the squad as, as the weeks went on. And, you know, I think some of the work we've done um, throughout the pre-season and, and since we landed here, you know, has left us in a good place. And James, just in terms of that line-up side of things, you come to all with the leadership elements that come with that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, I had a bit of a taste of it again last week, uh, or, you know, the, the last Wales game, and, um, you know, so whenever I'm in that role, I, I enjoy it. And um, as I said, you know, certainly... Um, when Hendy, Peter, and myself are playing, um, it's very much um, a case of kind of sharing the responsibility and the load uh, in that regard. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of chipping in together, and when you combine that with the with the experience Best he has, um, you know, I think when we get things right, um, you know, we can be strong in that area. Like, what if you're not too away from the rugby rank path? Yeah, it's been good, you know. Um... You know, so we moved here uh, during the week, but um, up in Shiva, it was it was nice. It was a nice place to get over the jet lag. Um, 
you know, the hotel was incredible, to be fair. Uh, a lot of amenities in it, a lot of recovery, sort of, um, you know, areas of the pool and all that. And, um, you know, the area was it was nice, nice place to settle in. You know, we had a big shopping centre on our, on our door, a few nice restaurants around. There was always uh, stuff to do and, and to pop in, I suppose, away from it. You know, we had a few down days as well. Um, you know, we haven't really got up to much mad things to be honest with you kind of similar just popping around floating about and getting a bit of grub here and there uh Jay, yeah I, I didn't head to chinatown yesterday and i took a harbor cruise in believe it or not me rory best and henderson very sensible of us i must say <laughs> uh james went to chinatown didn't you you can maybe pick up on the food it's your yeah, special yeah. Um, well the food's great here um i love ramen and sushi um but a few of us went into chinatown yesterday we had a great dim sum lunch uh, in a fantastic, uh, fantastic restaurant, but I've loved this the kind of uh, time we've had off the pitch. Like the people are so friendly and polite here, um, so um, it's been great. And obviously we were in, we were in Ichiba last week in, in Yokohama um, this week, so it's nice to, to get a bit of taste of, of the different places as well. Uh, Ty Andy Carroll was saying during the week that there's been an increased level of intensity and there's something brewing amongst the squad. Can you describe that a little bit? What's the difference between like this week and the last couple of weeks just in terms of that intensity? Um, I suppose a bit more time together, a bit more in the sort of um, rugby, rugby um, mode. Um, I think also the fact is, you know, we're here since we arrived in Japan last Thursday evening and you know, we're playing on Sunday. So, you know, you see everything starting to ramp up, open ceremonies, you see teams getting named was it yesterday, the day before, for the first game uh, tonight? So um, I think the realization to work up is here, and also as maybe a small bit of itchiness to get going. And I think lads are, you know, in a good place. Bodies are right over the jet lag, and I think everyone's just looking forward to getting out on the pitch. And I think with that brings that bit of intensity. Uh, I love was made before the tournament about Joe keeping faith in Rory Best as captain. What does he bring? to this World Cup, having played in, in three previous ones, what, what did he bring to the year? I probably wouldn't say enough about the man. Um, I suppose he, look, he leads with his actions. He's incredibly good for us as a group of players. I think he represents us unbelievably well. And, um, you know, his attention in detail, how he keeps his bodies right, you know, for an aged man of 37, he's, you see him running around in pre-season, you know, he's fit as a fiddle, honest to God. And, um, you know, I go to anywhere with him and back, and I think, you know, I probably speak for the whole squad in terms of that, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. That's uh, Tyke Furlong uh, wrapping up that press conference of Seth and James Ryan there. I mean, they're kind of limited in what they, wasn't a huge amount of standout lines out of that, but they are kind of limited in what they can say because they've, like managed to get themselves this far. We can all accept that there's an itchiness to get started yeah. for everybody yeah. so that we don't have to sit through any more press conferences like like those two are it goes without saying so crucial to anything Ireland might achieve because nine months ago they were bulletproof yeah. absolutely like he was still in the position of not losing a competitive game James mm. Ryan they probably both had a slight dip an understandable dip they need to be right back mm. but even when you're talking about Rory Best there like, like Ireland's line out are you 100% confident about it yeah, I know. We're going to go, you can see on your screen there, Keane Healy and Greg Feek are uh, getting themselves lined up. But not all to, the big uh, boys to today, the, quite literally. Uh, to, meet the, uh, to meet the press. Um, yeah, it is a bizarre one. And like, it, what pressure is on that very first Ireland oh. line-out? And Scotland has some like unbelievable operators, obviously, at the second row as well, that can put massive heat in it. And you can be assuming that most of their planning. Let's get over to that, uh, back to Yokohama, Keane Healy and Greg Feek. Getting better and better over the last couple of years. And much more of a threat. I think Nell is going pretty well at the moment. He's he's a bit of a cornerstone for them. So um yeah, he'd be dealing with a lot of his tactical scrumming and the angles and whatnot he might be looking for. So um yeah, we've kind of simulated a little bit of that to be able to plan for it, but you can never plan. So we, we stick on our own schedule for a lot of it and and uh work on what we want to assert on them as opposed to trying to defuse their bombs. You've all gathered kind of back to last June, you've been in Japan for a week. Are you itching to get going now? That's ah, bubbling over now, yeah. Um, the move to here now has been uh, kind of 
real eye opener that it's here. And you know, and Joe said it the other day about uh, it becoming very real when the first team start getting named, and that kind of burned at me a bit. I was like, yeah, we're here, we're ready to go now, and start building in. And, and you know, we've put a, a lot of work and a lot of dedication into clarity on everything, into getting ourselves into physical shape and stuff. So it's um, yeah, it's just something to get a chance to put that on show. Greg, very much the same thing for you that this is years of work culminating in this weekend. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of history there in terms of guys coming through um, that weren't at the last World Cup and that are that are now here starting. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs for for everyone in the last four years to get to this point. A lot of ups, particularly. Um, and yeah, I think like shoot, we're we're all excited. Um, Everyone's got nerves, but I think it's kind of been channeling in a good way. We're all pretty tight. So, um, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of, um, I suppose, these next couple of days, even before our game, and they will even start to be a bit of adrenaline watching some of the games and seeing the atmosphere and and then seeing the, the crowds and things like that. That'll, um, that'll kind of help things as well. Ian, it's been interesting seeing the Irish players get settled into Japanese culture. You embrace the Seymour wrestling, I think, more than any other player looked like the other day. I talk to us about that experience. Uh, that was class. Um, I did that as well on the tour in 17 and uh, when it came an option this time I was kind of urging the lads to do it saying how good it was because it's uh, culturally one of the best things I did last time around get an understanding of it that they're not just big lumps you know the, the amount of training that they put in their flexibility strength power everything you know is um it was a really good experience to get that and, and then chat to the lads after. And, um, you know, they were pretty open and stuff. They just wouldn't let us stand down on the ring. Ian, um, Dave Kilcoyne has been probably the best uh, form of his life. You ever, you ever happened to have him off? <laughs> yeah. Um, for how long, I don't know. He's uh, he's rampaging at the moment and playing some serious ball. And... Uh, you know, I think he had a niggle last year that probably held him a little bit back and, and he's, he's got an opportunity to, to put game on game and work on strength and fitness and everything and um, he's in the best shape I've seen him in quite some time. So uh, that's massive credit to the work that goes in. I've been in that position too where you're, uh, you're probably on the back foot a bit and you just need to dig your head in the sand and start working and keep it to yourself. And you know, you can see that uh, you can see that he's put in a lot of graft over the last while. So uh, so it's going to be a nice head-to-head battle with uh, himself and myself. But as always, we're kind of working unison on that and drag each other forward instead of tucking the head down and going against someone. Yeah, that's uh, Keen Healy and uh, Greg Feek there at the press conference in Yokohama. Um, I mean, Nathan Murphy's main commentary on uh, the goings-on so far at the press conference has been in relation to the backdrop. Um, we'll go back to the lads there in a couple of minutes. It's, you're not happy with it, Nathan. It's shoddy. It's not ironed. Cheap, amateurish looking. This is a World Cup. This is the big time. And as I pointed out, Adrian, we're in Japan. All the technology they have, they could have a shit hot backdrop, mm. electronic screen. That's right. I literally looked at that and thought, come on. Yeah. Um, Straight out of the bag from the long haul flight. That, uh, that you're exercised about the, uh, the big things. You can see that press conference ongoing. Keen Healy? Mainly because of the length of the period, you know, if it's a. Uh, Short period, you can you can knuckle down, stay in the hotel, and and keep activities to a minimum. But over uh, over six seven weeks, you know, you, you that's just not sustainable to stay in the hotel and not do things. And uh, it's important to have things that we can get out to and do, but don't spend too much time on our feet. You know, lads, lads did it wisely about going into Tokyo or whatever. It was in for three hours, back out, chill out down in the hotel, and and try and actually schedule your downtime a bit better than walking and covering seven, eight, nine K. You know, it's it's just about uh, I suppose wisely using your time off that's that's gonna benefit you because the real thing off the down day is it's a day to recover to train the next day. And then Greg the scrum obviously on scrum so so long. Um is this the time when it can be at its best and you can really use it as a weapon? Um obviously one for winning penalty for two for um, yeah, I think that there's probably all teams, all the teams here, all the coaches, the players. That's probably um, the ultimate um, aim is for that to happen, you know. Um, but I think with the preparation that all the teams have had, um, the strength and conditioning, all that, it all gets guest tested. 
um, for the first time this week. So really, it's just uh, um, you know, for us, it's um, you back yeah, you back the players to to do that job. Um, but all that stuff comes to fruition. That's why we're here. Even, um, given your own journey that you're on, the injury problems that you have, do you learn to sort of appreciate moments like this now as you're going to another World Cup? Uh, I've always appreciated them. There's no denying that now, but um, it's probably more an age thing than anything that makes you makes you look deeper into it and probably look out for others a bit more in us. Um, I'm pretty thankful of my position considering where it was, yeah, a couple of years back. And uh, it's been a lovely route back to it of chasing fitness and getting there and, and enjoying doing it. But um, no, it's probably about just keeping chatting to lads and, and small steering. I'm not a big uh, leader role or anything like that, but uh, small steering for me would be more what I try and focus on, grabbing lads one on one and and working on little things like that. Okay, okay. You're obviously going to focus on the battery. Outside is the other name of the pack, like that. The quality across the. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't quite. You're going to focus on the, the battery, obviously, but outside is the name of the pack. Sorry, I can't count. Okay. Are you excited sorry. about naming our pack? Oh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, yeah, no, exactly, yeah. It's. Um, again, it, it's probably the excitement is really just to see what this pack can do, you know? Um, so much work put in um, by everybody again, and, and even when you look at how much work our S and C guys put in with them, you know, and they they just it's hours upon hours. Um, the dedication, the commitment of them going to the gym, um, the rehab with everyone else. So the whole management, I think, um, we're excited about about that. And, and these combinations of slowly being building is, um, you know, there is um, some real benefits around um, having good combinations that have been together for a while. Uh, yeah, it is true. We had um, Colin from 3FE in Dublin sent us over 50 kilos of coffee and sourced us a machine over here through, uh, through someone that supplies machines over here. So I've been in charge of packing it up and moving it around and whatnot, but uh, it's certainly been of use. <laughs> Okay, we'll take that Yeah. Um, Ireland is uh, number one ranking, uh, yeah, IRB. Uh, but, uh, we'll talk about the way to work out about uh, New Zealand, so that, but that's very often. Did something uh, upsetting for the group, and do you think uh, Ireland is under estimated uh, 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 under- uh, uh, Underestimated, I don't think so. Um, no, I think we're showing pretty good respect around and that we're a dangerous team. But as far as ranking goes, uh, if we're number one in seven weeks, then I'd be happy with it. But uh, it doesn't so much matter now. And uh, now it matters about the performances we put in and and show the hunger that we want to play good rugby and, and enjoy what we're doing. And if we do that, I'll go well seven weeks' time. Okay, thank you. All right, Keane Healy and Greg Feek there at the Ireland Press Conference in Yokohama. We'll be bringing you much more of those over the course of the tournament. Um, and uh, that's where we're going to leave that for the minute. Uh, Owen Shane is going to join us on the line. You're leaving out the best line of the entire the sumo morning stuff. so far. They're not just big lumps, you know. <laughs> Keane Healy it was on the best, sumo wrestlers. That's the best stuff that we've had so far. In case you just joined us and you haven't seen the team uh, on this Friday morning, delighted to have you along with us. Uh, do keep your comments coming in. We've loads of those to bring you in just a few minutes' time, but we'll recap on the team before we take another step. It's Jordan Larmer who's been named uh, at fullback, just his fifth ever start in that position in an Irish jersey. Andrew Conway on the right wing and Jacob Stockdale over on the left. Bundy Aki and Gary Ringrose partner up in midfield. You've Conor Murray and Johnny Sexton in the halfbacks. Uh, then up front in the back row, Peter O'Mahony, uh, Josh van der Flaer and CJ Stander gets the nod at uh, number eight. Ian Henderson and James Ryan in the second row and Keane Healy, Rory Best and Tyg Furlong across the front row. On the bench, Niall Scannell, Dave Kilcoyne, Andrew Porter, Tyg Byrne, Jack Conan, Luke McGrath, Jack Carty and Chris Farrell. So that is your Irish 23 to take on Scotland on this uh, Sunday morning, quarter to nine start in Pool A. Uh, and we'll be keeping a very close eye as well on action uh, a little bit later on this morning. Quarter to 12 Irish time is the kick-off between Japan and uh, Russia also, of course, in our pool. Plenty of comments that have come into us 
uh, this morning. A few of them that I'll pluck out here from uh, YouTube. Kevin Callahan is excited. He says it's showtime. A negative news talk, exciting team, says Sean Larkin, who gets his platforms wrong. But we do take the point that Nathan's been a bit too negative about it. I'm just a little bit concerned. I can understand where he's coming from in that people have called for this sort of an exciting backline, I think, for the last couple of years. That actually, if we'd had this sort of backline in train, you would be excited about it. If it was an offloading game with these players, it'd be brilliant. I just sort of feel it is round peg, square hole sort Negative of. Negative as well. I, wonder, I get it. You're explaining you're losing, as you once said to me. Uh, I prefer Conway over Earl, says Marco Callahan. Uh, Earl's hasn't played in a while now, and Conway is on fire. I hope you're right. Uh, Kevin Callahan saying that Conway should be at 15, but we'll see. Uh, certainly a lot of sentiment in that regard. There ain't no show like a Joe show. Um, says another commenter here on YouTube. Uh, somebody else also backing up that idea about Conway at 15. Hard ground, uh, says another, won't suit Carney. He finds it hard to play two weeks in a row. There probably won't be hard ground is the thing. No, it's... It'd probably be quite soft ground. Well, I guess it depends on how the pitch cuts up. It's yeah. going to be lashing rain. Yeah. It's not going to be rock hard, bone dry, that's for sure. Uh, and he's not going to have to play two weeks in a row. Dave Kelly says, just understand why Larmer wasn't picked against Wales if he had a doubt about bringing Addison, who played well. Um, Jesus, lads, come on. I swear to God, if Joe can get us to a semi-final, I absolutely promise to take a lot of alcohol and go to Mass every Sunday. Says our fits. All right. It's a big commitment. Um, Fish Bandit says, here's a mad one. Joe wants us to, as Nathan looks around, to say, oh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> hang about. Here we go. It's YouTube. Uh, Joe wants us to lose this game, hopefully not lose all confidence and beat the rest, and then not meet, uh, not meet uh, New Zealand, South Africa in the quarters. I mean, I don't know what sort of a plan he has Fish to bandit. avoid. That is the greatest load of bollocks I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> it's that Joe Schmidt, like we, I, I know we raise Joe Schmidt's genius to levels maybe that he can never fully attain, but to suggest he's going out hoping to lose to Scotland yeah. to lower expectations and then we'll um, incredibly bounce back. We also have no option but to play <laughs> either New Zealand or South Africa, no matter what happens, barring some sort of a total outlier of results where either one of those get beaten. I know we're going to talk a lot more rugby, but as someone said, it's showtime. Like it is, we're what, four hours away from kickoff. Yeah. Suddenly you find yourself going, oh, it's 5.45 tomorrow morning, Australia, Fiji. Like tomorrow is one of the great days of rugby mm. of recent times. 5.45, Australia, Fiji, it'll be a proper game. Then you've got France, Argentina. Yeah. And then you've got the All Blacks against I South know. Africa. Well, there will be nothing done uh, for the next eight weeks or whatever it is. Well, we have a uh, off the ball night out tonight. And yeah. I think our old age is going to really catch up with us. Mm -hmm. Because I know well the young lads are going to power through. Yeah. They're going to watch the whole thing. They're going to be staying up straight from Coppers to watching Australia against Fiji. Yeah. That's, what, that's your plan, is what you're saying? I will be at home in bed at 11 <laughs> o'clock, just so I can get up in time to watch the All Blacks. Right, let's uh, tell you what's happening in the papers. Do keep your comms coming in. We want to hear any reaction to that team. We're going to talk to Alan Quinn a little bit later on. We're going to talk to Brendan Mackin as well. And we're back to Owen Shahan uh, in Yokohama to get his thoughts post that press conference as well very shortly. But uh, we do want to hear from you this morning. So wherever it is you're consuming us, be it on uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, or on OTB Sports Radio on the Go Loud app, we're delighted to have you along with us this morning and we do want to hear from you. So let's tell you what's happening in the back pages. A lot of the newspapers did have that team, uh, turns out. They weren't quite saying it was named, uh, but they certainly had that uh, selection. Schmidt puts full faith in Larmer for full back roll. Uh, writes Rory O'Connor here. Coach names New Look back three as Carney and Earls lose fitness race for a cup opener. It was interesting to hear that um, early in that press conference, Joe Schmidt said that Carberry and Earls were very close and that it looks like Carberry is going to be the 24th man as well, should there be any uh, late fall-off on that Irish team. I mean, maybe it's all a great ruse and Carberry is actually going to go in there. He would be a better utility back option than most of the players that are there. And also, uh, Carl Dennehy writing here that English calls for transparency after omission from Worlds. This is the news that uh, a frustrated Mark English uh, has hit out at the lack of transparency from a sports governing body, as it's put here, after the three-time European medalist missed out in a place at this year's World Championships. Uh, he missed out due to places being taken by unqualified athletes. The IAAF allow each federation to enter one male and one female athlete who haven't hit the qualifying mark uh, but he hasn't been that selection from an Irish point of view and it seems like eight such athletes from different countries elected to run the men's 800 metres and it means that English uh, will be forced to watch uh, from home despite running several seconds quicker than all of them. It's bizarre. It's a bit of a bizarre story but there is, there will and I'm certain there will be another side to this, uh, there will be some statement I'm sure um, from his governing body at some point today. Uh, the star goes with no Mooney, 
Almost Noel, but Noel Mooney. Chief rules out staying at FAI. This is a story that Noel Mooney has categorically ruled out remaining on as FAI general manager when his six-month contract expires at the end of November. He has also said he won't be applying for the permanent post as the association's chief executive when it's advertised in the coming weeks. It does beg the question of what has been the point of Noel Mooney back at the FAI. He's been very public online, on Twitter, in interacting with the grievances of... Irish football supporters and trying to get people into a room. Obviously, he was in contact with Brian Kerr and certainly seems to have been doing the positive thing of trying to mend the issues that were there. Own hand is back in, invited to games. He's been on off the ball, airing his issues with the FAI from the previous regime. But he's doing all these things and then he's riding off to the sunset next month. So, like, who's going to follow through on any promises or any discussions? What's the point in having all these conversations if he's not actually going to be there to follow them through. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what sort of long-term strategy he has put in place, but from mm. what I can gather, having spoke to people over the, even over the last week or two, that he has done a lot of really good work on the process of things, and uh, they were obviously in a bit of a bind, I suppose, to put it um, uh, as softly as, as is possible. A bit of a bind uh, when he came in, and he was seen, obviously, as a safe pair of hands who knew the scene, I suppose, apart from anything else, because he could have easily have brought in, parachuted somebody in from the outside just to get them through all that. Um, there was now always the indication that he was going to leave uh, when he got towards the end of his tenure. That seems to, way, seems to be the way it's going to be. But it does seem like he has been a fairly safe pair of hands over the last six months. He's been yeah, somewhat well, transparent, as you say. He's been out on Twitter and he's been answering questions about those things. And so much as he can, given that he's now exiting stage left. But definitely, from what I've heard, the, the uh, strategy and the process of things in the background, that's the boring stuff about getting everything back in line. It seems like he's been actually pretty good at that. Yeah, and well really I guess we're still only in the middle of this because all the reports are just going to start coming out over the next few weeks. So he will be there for some of that and obviously what happens his after hands that? are... Well, do you wait for try and bring somebody else in? The post of CEO is going to be advertised. I think we're entering a period of nobody can quite be sure because we have to wait for these reports. An awful lot of people are going to come up in those reports. Mm. Like we're talking three or four reports, the Mazar's report due out over the next few weeks as to who is in a position to apply for the role of CEO. Like Donald Conway is still there as president. I think, unfortunately, for Noel Mooney, it seemed as though his hands were tied with that, that while Mooney was there, while Rhea Walsh was there, and while he was there, it did seem as though it was too far, far too strong a connection mm. to the old regime. So... They said the chief executive role is going to be advertised in the next few weeks. Presumably that person, it'll be early New Year. A lot of the reports will be out by then and maybe they can have some sort of a clear run at trying to yeah. rescue the situation. Uh, the other story, which is an interesting one in the back of the Irish Daily Star, is Jack is one in a million. Shamrock Rovers will seek a new Irish record transfer fee, possibly running into a million euro plus before considering any offers for Jack Byrne. He's under contract until the end of the 2021 season. They got 350 grand for Graham Burke when he went to Preston. Even a million euro. Listen, it's a know, gigantic yeah. leap forward for Irish football. A million euro is nothing. Should, shouldn't it be more about putting in sell-on structures? Like that, Surely that's where the money is. I, I'm sure there would be part of that as well within this, but and listen, it's, I guess, chicken and egg in terms of so you get a million euro in for Jack Byrne, suddenly you can offer your younger players long-term contracts, which means when clubs come sniffing yeah. around them, you can demand a better fee, because the biggest part of the problem all these clubs have had is it's short-term contracts, everybody's out of a deal in six months' time, so you can't actually demand no. any sort of a fee. No. And like the unusual situation where, like obviously Dundalk would have earned vast multiples of that sum in their European mm. run, that was a far more profitable thing. thing. Normally it's the sell-on of your best players that brings in the money. Who was, the pre was it 350 grand the previous for time? Burke. Was that the pre previous mm. high? Are you saying that with any confidence? You're our no, I'm, 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 I'm running, I'm running uh, back through my mind very quickly. Of Shamrock Rovers no, fan, I, I is that imagine. fair enough to say? No, I go to Shamrock Rovers because they're the closest club to where I live. I'm a Galway United man. Yeah, well, that. Uh, my children are Shamrock Rovers supporters, though. But that's You're done now. Conway Call is uh, the top line here in the Irish Daily Mail this morning. Rory Keane, Munster man, face Scots in Cup Opener. We've been bringing you that news that Andre Conway starts in the right wing. Jordan Larmer at full back. And Greenwood to the rescue for United is the splash here. 17 year old, I think it's two weeks' time, he turns 18. Uh, Mason Greenwood with a pretty stunning goal, it has to be said, from a Manchester United side who couldn't hit a 
Uh, couldn't hit a barn door uh, last night by all accounts from all of their more experienced players, so Mason Greenwood to the rescue. Uh, on the back of The Guardian, fired up Robert Kitson on rugby's chance to shine in Japan. Uh, some other stories of interest there, Billy Vinopola, Tonga and me, interesting story inside on an emotional Billy Vinopola, ready to follow in his family footsteps. Uh, both his father and his uncle appeared in a World Cup. 20 years ago, his dad, Theo, and his brother, Elisi, were part of the Tonga side who played England at Twickenham. And two day kids on, Billy picks up the torch. And the other story, which is in a lot of the English papers in particular, down the bottom, Beardsley banned coach racially abused black players. And this is obviously a huge story in English football. That former England striker, former Liverpool striker, Peter Beardsley, banned from football for 32 weeks. Pretty shocking stuff within this. Mm. Uh, found guilty of three charges of racially abusing black players while coach of the Newcastle under-23 team. And Peter Beersley went, this went to um, a committee and the panel concluded that it was obviously racist and wholly unacceptable what he says. Several players from the other age system came forward with evidence. So even though it's a 32 game ban, it is hard to see how Peter Beersley can have. 32 week ban. It's hard to see how Peter Beersley can have any future mm. in English football. Yeah, L reading the quotes, which we won't repeat because they're pretty distasteful, mm. um, like he deserves everything he gets and also deserves to be made an example of, I think, because actually it's the only way to. You need to send out some sort of message that is cut through right through the grades as well, right? Like it's it, a lot of this is a lot of this is about sending a message to the wider football family, to borrow that uh, to borrow that expression. That this stuff is just it's just not on. Peter Beardsley is obviously a huge name within English football, certainly for anyone, maybe younger listeners don't remember Peter Beardsley, but he was very much a part of that unbelievable Liverpool side of the late 80s. And the fact the 32 games does seem quite, 32 Week. weeks does seem quite lenient when you realise, like, he didn't put his hands up and admit this. In fact, the commission condemned Beardsley's assertion that three back players had been making up the allegations because they were motivated by financial greed. Uh, not only did Mr Beardsley allege that some of the players had put their heads together to tell serious and hugely damaging lies, but he advanced a florid story of greedy motives implicating the agent of two of them, which he must have known did not have a shred of evidence. Yeah. And I know what you're saying, it is uh, somewhat lenient, but <clears throat> the reality is that his Reputation coaching career is destroyed and forever. media career is, mm. he will, shall never appear again, I would suggest. The Irish Examiner, meanwhile, in this Friday morning, it's got a beautiful uh, image there from Rugby World Cup in Japan. Big in Japan, the wait is over, Rugby World Cup 2019 uh, kicks off, and indeed we are just um, under four hours away now from the start between Japan and Russia, and uh, more reflection on uh, Messing Greenwood's goal last night for United. Uh, on the back of the Herald, similar to a lot of the Irish papers, the picture is of Mason Greenwood after his goal. The story is on the Irish team news, but also Con. Conor Callan was out doing media duties yesterday. He said, I hope Jim stays on. Uh, Conor Callan says, it's absolutely his decision. All the players love playing for him. I don't know. There's been a lot of talk in the media, but as far as we're concerned, it's the same as usual. Celebrate for the next couple of months. Reconvene come December. Do it all again. So uh, the sun, meanwhile, nice one, Mason. Nice one, Mason. Am I missing? I mean, one? he's won the game for them. Okay. Yeah. Four. Uh, Manchester United won a stand and nil at Sand. Uh, let's Joe Easy on them, uh, writes Neil Reardon here as well. Joe Smith has played at safe by not picking any of his injury concerns for the big one on Sunday. Uh, the back of the mirror, green shoots for Ole. Mason makes history to rescue Solskjaer's United. Gary Ringrose getting the nod and also touching on Arsenal. Impressive 3-0 win against Frenford. Emery back super kids. Uh, Unai Emery praising the likes of Joe Willock and Bugayo Saka who were both on target in last night's win. Uh, the Times, uh, London edition, Beardsley is banned for racist abuse. That's the story that Nathan's been telling you about there a few minutes ago. The thoughts here, Martin Ziegler, and also that photograph there of Owen Farrell training to lift the Rugby World Cup on like they just can't help themselves. Like, he's back in the throttle a little bit, lads. Give it a few weeks, let the excitement build up, and then be writing stuff about that. Uh, we might talk a little bit later on in the show about the ad that's been released uh, for the English rugby team as well, which is, uh, I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's bizarre. Entertaining. It's certainly bizarre. Um, the Irish Times sports section, that uh, photograph of that advertising installation has got a lot of traction in the papers this morning. They also have that photograph. Nice. Uh, 
Thundery Skies could be an omen for the real business, a preview of the tournament from Jerry Thorny, also from Liam Toland. Standard says game needs to rid itself of doping. This obviously covered in depth on the yesterday morning's OTB AM. Uh, the quotes from CJ Standard, the paper is really just getting around to it today. Not a huge amount of coverage of it actually in the papers because it is more preview mm. now that we are on the actual eve of the tournament. But um, CJ Standard's quotes of not really seeing any doping in South Africa. Very much a story yesterday. Yeah, I just want to hear player like outside of you know a, a very, you're very it's extremely unlikely that players going to come out and say oh I saw all of that going on. You just want to make sure that the debate is nice and open and there's no because we've seen little bits and pieces this week where players or coaches have been just keen to shut down the conversation mm. and not entertain it at all. You just would like to see at very least that it's an open forum. I don't think we're going to get that in the middle of a World Cup. Mm. I think we get some honest opinion, but it's very difficult to see. Like all the media advisors who are around these teams are going to be saying, shut it down. Yeah. Shut it down. Don't say anything. Have you one more for us? One more. This is the Telegraph. And again, it is very much a Rugby World Cup preview. Blockbuster fixtures, contenders galore, glorious backdrop, hope and expectation. It is time for action, McCleary's preview. And contenders galore, I guess, is one of the major talking points that actually it feels, because the All Blacks have come back to the pack, that there is no standout contender that any one of six or seven teams you wouldn't be surprised to see win this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you going for? The All Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Who are you going for? Um, I don't know. I want to see the first round of games, to be honest, before I get too carried away with it. But I, it's difficult because it could be any one of those. It could easily be England. It could easily be South Africa. Like, New Zealand is the very obvious one. Mm. Like, I am a great believer in the mantra of tournaments taking on a life of its own because looking at so many of the previews around England, and Owen Farrell is clearly the golden boy. Mm. Like, it's such an attritional game now. I mean, Owen Farrell can so easily get injured. And that's it. Mm. It's done for England. I mean, you could say similar things about Ireland. Exactly. exactly. But that, and that is going to happen to two or three of the, these teams, that they I will lose their talisman. They can afford to lose Owen Farrell. More than Ireland than can lose... Johnny Sexton. Yeah. Well, Owen Farrell isn't even starting it out half tomorrow. Yeah. George Ford is. So. Yeah, and that will, that will continue during the tournament. Uh, Colin Murphy has been in touch on Facebook. Says Conway's uh, on his second choice fullback at Munster. That's not good enough to be first choice for Ireland. Hashtag common sense. Our best eight not playing. No Cronin off the bench is a huge loss. Not feeling optimistic. So this is not the uh, the fake news media. This is uh, Colin Murphy on Facebook and uh, Donald Moore wondering who's Owen Shane, as in S H A N E. Shane. Shane is actually how the you Kerry pronunciation is this pronounce his name. Um, that's where we're going to leave that for the minute. Just to let you know as well that uh, Bowl Sports World Grand Prix of Darts returns to the City West Convention Centre uh, from the sixth to the twelfth of October and all this week in OTB AM. But thanks to the PDC, we're giving you the chance to win the ultimate darting experience. You and a guest are going to win two VIP tickets to the Bowl Sports World Grand Prix final, uh, plus a night stay at the City West Hotel, including breakfast on that uh, Saturday. And we're also giving you a pair of tickets to Friday's semi-finals. Uh, that's each morning this week to give away. So there are two steps to enter the competition. And there have been a bucket load of you so far uh, this week. So do get into the action. Firstly, you've got to share the OTB AM uh, stream wherever it is you're watching or listening. Uh, you can retweet if you're uh, tweeting this competition, uh, which we will be doing. And tell us who won the 2015 World Grand Prix of Darts. Who was it? And uh, retweet the stream as well. Tickets as well, by the way, can be purchased at Ticketmaster.ie where you just go on there and search darts. Pretty decent prize, Nathan. Are you a bit of a, a darts man? I like on a Thursday evening, if there's nothing else on, I'll sit and watch it. Been to the I've, darts? I've been to the darts. Were, the, were we both at the yeah, darts? Yeah, the, the, the three arena? Yeah, three arena. Yeah, like the darts was kind of irrelevant. Yeah, it was, yeah. It's also really hard to see. Well, they've giant screens, Adrian. Like, they if they didn't screens. have the giant screens, you. Yeah. Wouldn't be able to see a single thing. It's a bit like... Um, it's a good night out, though. I was at co a college football match at the weekend. Uh. Oh, well, here we go. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. You weren't here last Friday. So you were in Chicago? Yeah, South Bend, yeah. Right, so you were over there for yeah. four days at working at a college football game because Notre Dame are coming to town? They are coming to town on August, I think, 29th next year to take on Navy in the Aer Lingus the College Football that's, Series. That's enough of the plugs. That's, yeah. that's all well and good. I haven't seen any footage from... Like, there's literally no proof that you were there. 
That will all become evident, Nathan. You just don't wear your cotton okay. socks about that one. Grand. Um, you had a good time, though? It was, it treated was, well? It was a brilliant, uh, brilliant trip, fact-finding mission. Um, fact-finding <laughs> mission? <laughs> the access what, to the... What facts did you access, find? There was, there was the really unusual scenario on the Saturday, obviously, where the game was just getting in the way, and there was like it was. It's roughly about eighty-two and a half thousand people that come into this stadium in Notre Dame. Okay. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it gets jammed. Like the previous day, there are tens of thousands of people milling around. Eighty-two and a half thousand people go into the stadium. There's about one hundred and eighty thousand come onto the campus for tailgating, and who just obviously vast majority of whom come in understanding that they ain't getting no tickets, but they're going to come in and hang around outside it's and have a few fish. beers, have a bit of a nice. barbecue, soak up the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is just. Electric, it's unbelievable. But you had the unusual scenario where at half time in the All Ireland football final, which we were watching into a plugged in uh, screen at the stadium, yeah. there was a choice to be made. Do you want to continue to watch the second half of the football and it was like 10 points each, or do you want to go down pitch side to get this unbelievable access to college football and stay down there for the first quarter of the game? So you stayed through to your roots? I um, had, to, had to go down to the pitch. Okay. Yeah. I was kind of glad when I saw that the goal had gone in. You'd gone that far. a little bit on Twitter when I got down there. Um, I was kind of glad that I went down there. It was sensational. I'll give you much more on that uh, again. I can't wait. But for now, I'm delighted to say, at uh, seven minutes past eight on this Friday morning, Alan Quinlan joins us on the line. Good morning to you, Alan. Good morning, lads. How are you? Good. Good Where are you? Well, I'm here in the Yokohama Bay Sheraton Hotel, the t Irish team hotel. Team, announce, uh, team announcement was about... 20 minutes, half an hour ago, maybe a bit longer, 45 minutes ago. So a um, couple of surprises in the backfield. Well, not really surprises, I suppose. There, um, we, we heard at the start of the week about the injury to, to Rob Carney and the story of Keith Earls maybe not making it. But um, it's still exciting. Um, there was a sense of, uh, sense of calm about Joe Schmidt his press conference and, and confidence, I think, and Rory Best as well. So I think they're certainly looking to get up and running and uh, it's been a long build-up for all the teams and Sunday will be, it'll be helter-skelter, I think. Yeah. Tell us, talk to us first of all about the, the makeup of the back row. We chatted a fair bit about it over the last while. In fact, it might have been two weeks ago you and I sat in the studio on this morning and spoke about the CJ Stander versus Jack Conan battle and it's Stander who's won it. It's Peter Mahoney, Josh van der Fleur and CJ Stander in the back row. What's your uh, initial thought on that? Yeah, it was the back row I, I would have picked, to be honest. Um, you know, you could certainly question maybe the way CJ has played and his form. Um, Jack Conan did get an opportunity over the two Welsh games and didn't... He played well, but didn't really stand out, have a really impactful game. And I think, you know, playing the two, two of them together for the second Welsh game, they both played well. Uh, Sander went well at six and, and, and Jack Conan played well at eight. I, I still think a lot of these players, and it's hard for guys when they're trying to chase form, if you get the opportunity like Jack Conan did, because you've only a couple of games played at the start of the season. And I know myself back in, when I played, sometimes it takes four or five games to really get that kind of match speed and that match fitness up. So Joe's gone back to the probably the experience scenario of CJ Stander and maybe what he's delivered in the last couple of years, which was high tempo, top quality performances. There is no doubt his form has dipped a little bit. Um, but sometimes as a coach, you make these decisions and you hope then a player can reward you with a big performance on Sunday and I think Josh van der Fleer was uh, had to be picked because of the threat of Hamish Watson who will start for Scotland at seven and the way the Scots will target our back row and uh, Peter O'Mahony then for his line out and, and probably leadership and, and captaincy being one of the vice captains of the team so we've said it a while Adrian that our back row need to have more impact in the game they need more carries more tackles they need to be getting up into double figures and unfortunately, in the last seven or eight months, they haven't got there. But this is an opportunity. And, and if we're going to be successful and do well at this World Cup, uh, we need our back row making a real impact. And in terms of impact off the bench then, so Jack Conan is among the replacements. Jean Klein doesn't make the 23. Joe Schmidt says he'll find his way through the tournament and there'll certainly be opportunities for him. Ty Byrne from the outside, it's felt as though he's never fully convinced Joe Schmidt, but he finds himself on the bench here. Schmidt mentioning in his press conference likes his ability to sort of change the game up, maybe can offer something different. What do you see Byrne's role being on Sunday? 
Well, I think it's that impact. Um, he can he can make a carry. He can make an offload. I think he he gets into the breakdown and and is phenomenal there at times. So. Um, I think it's the right call to have Conan and Byrne as your second row loose forward coming off off the bench because they can bring in real energy and, and that's exactly what you want if conditions are wet and windy and it's in the middle of the winter and it's in the Northern Hemisphere and you want to bring on a big brute like Klein, you know, you select him in the bench but this is going to be good conditions, the, the pitch is going to be top quality, um, Scotland play with a high tempo, um, and I think, you know, they're the two guys that I would have chosen to, to come off the bench. It's exactly what you want. And you want, you know, you want impact straight away, Nathan, and, and pace and stuff. And I think, you know, Bourne bring, Born brings that energy and brings that excitement. Why, why isn't he starting? Because James Ryan and, and, and Ian Henderson are your starting second rows as it stands, unless something changes in the next couple of weeks. And... Uh, so, you know, you look at the bench and there is impact there, real impact. Kilcoyne as well was superb in the warm-up games. He brings real energy off the bench as well. And and Chris Farrell is probably the interesting one. I know we're going to the outside backs now, but putting him on the bench, um, Jack Carty on the bench ahead of Joey Carberry, who we're told trained all week and was really sharp. So there's a couple of interesting calls on, in the outside back channels there as well. Yeah, uh, so pick up on that, Quinny Furs, if you will. Are you surprised that it's um, Larmer gets an out of 15 and not Conway? Um, in a sense, I am. Um, I, I thought it would, I, you know, personally, I would think it would be the other way around because I think if you go back to, I think it was November 18 when, when Jordan Larmer started at full back against Italy, um, his attacking ability is second to none, but. Um, some high 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 contests and stuff he didn't catch and on a few occasions he's been cut out of position um if he's been been in that full back position um so i think he he's an incredible athlete he has so much attack to his game so much excitement um but again it's a call from 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 joe schmidt and he's probably that stuff that they've worked on with jordan larmer i think it's the final piece in in, in the jigsaw for him to be a top a class exceptional international player because you know he has pace he has great football ability and i think if you look at rob carney you know sometimes rob carney has been calls to have him out of the team over the years maybe because of um his attacking ability against somebody else like larmer uh, but each time those calls have happened and somebody else has gone in there, there's been a call to get Rob Carney back in there because he's of his exceptional reading. So I think Jordan Larmer will have learned a lot in the last kind of 12 months about that role at full-back and you know, winning, winning ball in the air. Um, he has to, he's going to be testing on Sunday, there's no doubt. Laidlaw, Russell will, 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 will kick a lot of ball to him and challenge him there. But the two wingers are really important. Andrew Conway is really has a lot of experience and, and is good in the air, really good in the air. So Stockdale and Conway have got to help him as well on Sunday. Yeah, they might interchange a bit. And funny enough, it would have been a game that was totally cut out for Rob Carney in so many ways. How much will it dictate our play, Quinny? Like, if the conditions are a bit wet in, in terms of us with ball in hand, are we less likely? I know you're a big fan of kicking into the backfield where, ne where needs be to gain a bit of territory. Obviously, the danger there is it gets pumped right back at you. How much will their selection given the so few caps that both Conway and, um, and Larmer have, how much will their selection um, dictate Ireland's play? Well, it's, it's um, obviously if you're on the front foot and you're getting good quality ball and, and, and Ireland have a chance to attack and, and you can get... Uh, what I love about Conway and Larmer is they, they, they pop up in different positions. They just love to attack and Conway will come in off his wing. He'll be looking to come on the in, inside of Sexton. Um, if, the, if, if, if it becomes a bit unstructured um, and, and Larmer gets an opportunity to counter-attack, if you kick loosely to him, he can be brilliant. So they can be batch winners for you. I think if the conditions are wet and the ball is very, very slippy and Laidlaw and Russell are kicking a lot to him, they've got to do the fundamentals really well and win those balls in the air and, and be patient, sometimes not force it. I think it can impact both sides here on Sunday if it is wet because it's knowing when to attack and when to hold on to the ball and, 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 and just be patient. I think patience is, is required when, when the, when in wet conditions and just managing the tempo of the game, 
uh, playing intelligently and kicking in, in into the backfield and just getting your 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 kick chase line up the field. So um, I think both sides will have a few little attacking options that we haven't seen. They'll have stuff kept up their sleeve a little bit. Um, but from Ireland's point of view, it's just you would hope that their their lineout functions well and that their precision at the breakdown some of the strengths and, and the outstanding attributes that work so well from in 2018 but I, I have a bit of a fear I think Ireland will win the game but I have a real fear about how we cope early on I think Scotland will really come out of the blocks and try and go after Ireland You mentioned the line out how much pressure is there going to be given all the concerns we've had there and the evidence of a dysfunctioning uh, line out at times for Ireland how much pressure is there going to be on Rory Best to nail that first line out on Sunday? Well, there's going to be loads of pressure on, on Rory Best and James Ryan, Henderson, O'Mahony. I think um, again they've had they've they've had trouble with that in recent times. So I'm sure they'll have spoken a lot. Worked on a calling system and and some banker balls, if you like, that they're just going to make sure they will make it at the front of the line out, win the ball. But for Ireland to attack and for any team to attack in rugby, you want to try and win it at the middle or the tail of the line-out, and then you can launch your attack off that. So um, there's a lot of pressure, and hopefully to get that set-piece right, you would love, you know, with, with Omani back in the side, he, he he's a real line-out option. And I think for James Ryan, it's just calling, calling in the right areas and making sure there's pace and quick movement after the call is made. And I think that's the key because Gilchrist and, and Johnny Johnny Gray will be really trying to get up there and frustrate them. And again, if they lose one, Adrian, you don't panic. You've got to be careful. I've been in teams where the line hasn't gone well one week and you come back the next week and you lose your first line out. Do you allow all that negativity creep back in? You've got to keep calm and, and hope that things sort themselves out. So there's enough of experience there, and uh, but it is a real key area. James Ryan was talking there in the press conference about sharing responsibility with Peter O'Mahony and supporting Ian Henderson and making the calls on the line-out. Is that what you want in a game like this, that there are group decisions, there are conversations? Or like, would you prefer the one, and listen, it's not going to happen, the one commanding figure of a Devon Toner who's making those calls? Well, I, I think ideally, Nathan, you want a dominant leader who ultimately has the final call on where the ball is going. And, but you want impact. So we see a lot of little huddles before lineouts now where guys, when they're walking, particularly of penalties when you kick, it, when you kick it to touch, um, sometimes the lineout is chosen before the opposition even set up. And then they have an option of changing that with a buzzword to, to go somewhere else. Um, so you need, you need impact. You need people having a chat and saying, look, I'm free or, or you know, try this move or try this lineout. It'll work better. Um, and you got to tailor it to where the opposition are defending sometimes, but sometimes you just got to back yourself and go for it. So um, James Ryan has got to be the dominant force, but O'Mahony and Henderson and Best, they've got to have kind of chats with each other a lot as they move around the field and, and hopefully get it right. You're not going to get everyone right, but Scotland will put huge pressure on Ireland in that area on Sunday. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Quinny, just one text in here for you uh, from Paul Jones. Quinny, the most important Japanese that you're going to need to know, Nama Biru Kudasai. I have no idea what that means. Draft, tell me, Adrian. Draft beer, please. Draft beer, please. Okay. <laughs> well, that's probably important. Uh, tell, will you text me that one? I'll text it on to you. I, I, what, I won't remember. What's going to happen text on Sunday, finally, before you leave us? Um... I'm confident that they can build on what happened in the second half against Wales, where I saw huge energy and, and enthusiasm and, a, and a, a much more accurate performance from Ireland. Um, I think they've got to keep it relatively simple, I think, and just physically front up against Scotland, because I just have a feeling Scotland are going to target the first 10, 15 minutes to try and get scores on the board and unsettle Ireland. And if they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them um, and... and and impose themselves. I think they can settle into the game then and I, I, I believe they'll be good enough to win the game. All right, Quinny, we'll pick through it with you next week. Thanks a million. Take it easy. Cheers, lads. Good luck, Alan Quinlan on the line there from uh, Yokohama to pick through that team. We're going to join uh, Owen Shane very shortly. Do keep your comments coming in. 20 past eight on this Friday morning. Really pleased to have you along with us. Plenty of comments coming in and bring the wave very shortly. Right now it's time for ads.
OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Sport Ireland Campus Blanchard's Town is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you in the community. Check out our amazing offers for families with kids' camps, sport academies and birthday parties. Or for adults, why not join our gym with a 50-metre pool or your club, School friends can book one of our world-class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our athletics track, soccer, basketball or badminton courts, and many more. Check us out on sportirelandcampus.ie. Join Bruce Betting now for a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. That's right. New Irish accounts can enjoy a risk-free first bet up to €100. Euro. So if your first bet loses, we'll refund your stake with a free bet. Now that's giving you more. Bruce Betting, in store, online, and now on your phone. T's and C's apply. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlouis.net. OTB AM. Yeah, 22 minutes past eight on this Friday morning. So where was I? So, um, Notre Dame, right? <laughs> Aer Lingus. Did you get first class? Um, yeah, no. Good. No, 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 no. <laughs> Cattle class all the way as as uh, as I deserved, um, but yeah, no, anyway, phenomenal trip. The games coming over here next year. There will be loads of content. It's not even coming, this year from the trip, uh, twenty twenty. Ah, here. Yeah. So how many more of these the trips of are there between now? And the end then? of August next year. I mean, who knows? Uh, I love the end, all these people. End of August next year, and it's obviously the first of a five game series as well that's been locked in. There's going to be a couple of announcements of who the next opponents are going to be over the next couple of years. It's a hint. Well. It's uh, it seems like they are what going to be in that, with? that uh, Midwest. Okay. Uh, area, so um, you can sort of take your pick after that. But there'll be there'll be big names. There'll be um, so yeah, lots of good content. One of the most interesting conversations I had with was with a guy called Paul Brown, who's the head of communications at Notre Dame, and it's a massive outfit. There's over ten thousand students. There's about five thousand people working there. It's like a it's a city to all intents and purposes in Irish context. Um, but he was uh, involved in the communications department with MYPD during 9-11. Wow. And um, we chatted to him a little bit about that, so that will be a piece that will be coming your way uh, over the next couple of weeks. Really interesting chat with a really interesting guy um, who's obviously got loads of Irish connections as well, given the name and all that. So, um, yeah, that and more coming your way, Nathan, Oof. over the next while. So stay stay. Can't wait. Owen Shane, good morning to you. Good morning, lads. How are things? How are you getting on? That's some T-shirt. Hey, thank you very much. Is, is that a good I thing didn't mean it as a compliment, or, or, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here, Owen, I haven't, spo- I haven't spoken to you since you got to Japan, and my question before you went was how often you were going to get stopped for a photograph. You know, you know why. Uh, like, are the Japanese interested in you? What, why exactly, Nathan? Ex- explain it to me. I'm just because thinking he's off the ball all the time. Yeah, exactly. Like, People might recognise you. Uh, yeah, big in Japan, Owen. You're big in Japan. It must just be an absolutely ginormous city and they must have so many other impressive things going on because I have not got stopped for a photograph once. I was on uh, with, with Susan Keogh last week and she asked me, had anybody touched my hair? Is that a thing here? <laughs> that's, is, is that something where you, where you stop people and ginger hair is something that, I don't know, is fascinating to people here? I have noticed that there are very little ginger people here and I am probably the only person. Like, I, I, Do you ever have that moment where uh, you're in a crowded place and you accidentally make eye contact with somebody, and then your entire aim for the next five, ten minutes is to not make eye contact with that person again. I feel like every Japanese person is looking at me like that, but they're not trying to, to make eye contact with me. That, that's how I feel uh, on the trains all the time and uh, in crowded places. Uh, but that is the extent of this. Nobody stopped me for a photo. What um, is going on? I was in an adjoining country, uh, China, a couple of years ago, and it was in Tiananmen Square, and I was going around doing the sort of, as you do, the, like taking the photographs and enjoying it. And every so often I would see, I would see like a group of Chinese tourists somewhere close by taking a selfie with me in the background, but like, but you're like, ah, oh, no, they're just, they're just taking it. They're taking it. Yeah, square. After a while, I was like, this is happening too often for it to be just a coincidence. And then after a while, there were people coming up to me and saying, do you mind if we get a photograph? And they would all jump in and smile and put the thumbs up and the, give it all that. And I'm like, sending there like a clown. So that's, that's what happens on. I'm sure it's definitely going to happen to you at some point. I'm really jealous of that. Uh, <laughs> maybe when we go down to the, the south of Japan, when we get away from Tokyo, we move into the more rural areas. The next place we go to, Hamamatsu, which is beside Shizuoka, where we're playing. If it doesn't happen there, then it's not going to happen at all because I think that's as rural as we're going to get. So hopefully it happens, and I'll try and ask them for a selfie back when they stop me and ask for one. We're obviously um, very concerned about Owen. Obviously, we've sent him over to the far side of the world. 
young lad from the outer reaches of Kerry. There's a, you know, just a, a natural concern that everything will go okay. So I checked Kerry. in with him last week. Mm. I checked in just to see how was Japan going. He replied, it's grand, massive, massive place. <laughs> Have you any more depth to add to your Japanese journey? Oh, of course. There's tons of depth. Uh, I was sure I brought you on a walking tour yesterday sure, through uh, Shibuya Crossing. You, you got me last Saturday, Nathan, which was just when I was about to get over the jet lag and then the Kerry game being on in the middle of the night ended up putting me back again uh, a couple of days. Uh, like that, that is the first thing that does strike you here when you get here. It's just it, particularly this city is ginormous. You, can't, you have to park everything you know or you think you know about negotiating big cities when you come to this particular city. You can't just say to somebody, oh, I'll meet you in town or uh, see you in the city centre or something like that because it could take you a day or a week to actually find them. There are multiple, multiple different city centres here, multiple different places that could be referred to as town. And it is absolutely incredible. It is, it is mind-blowing. I still haven't just figured out how bizarrely massive this city is. And I'm leaving on Monday, hopefully come back for the quarterfinal to get my head around it a little bit more. Like going out to Chiba the, the last couple of days was, was insane. I was like, why are there kids in school uniforms? It's Saturday or it's Sunday. Why is Disneyland here? It's Disneyland in Japan. On the way to Ireland training, everybody gets off the train and still it's packed. Then all of a sudden you're getting off the train and you're at a massive gaming conference and you can't find where the bloody rugby press conference is. It feels like there are so many people here and none of them have been here for rugby, except until now because it is starting to ramp up a little bit. You, like, as I showed yesterday, there are big billboards, there are big pictures of, of rugby stars uh, around the city centre, and it seems like a tournament is going to happen at long last. Yokohama is going to be unbelievable. Like, uh, down here o over the last couple of days, this it feels like far more of a, a smaller city. It's, it's Tokyo light, and uh, it is a place that is conducive to a lot of big fan groups mingling over the next 48 hours or so because you're going to have the box down here you're going to have the all blacks down here you're going to have irish and you're going to have scots that is quite the cocktail for tonight and tomorrow night wow are you normally in the habit of saying to people i'll meet you in the city center <laughs> well you know uh, it's so that's uh O'Connell Bridge North or South, basically, or is, is, is how that, that response comes, or Stephen's Green area or something like that. You'll figure it out within five minutes. Just get, it, get a bus or lose into the city centre and uh, you'll find one another in 20 minutes. Uh, doing that here is just uh, a really, really stupid thing to do. So I don't know why that was ever on my mind. I could have just done a quick Google, is Japan big? And the answer probably would have been yes. I am very jealous of you, particularly this weekend, because so many people are obviously heading over for this match and maybe trying to get the first couple of games. But also, like you touched on the fact that New Zealand and South Africa are also playing in Yokohama. And we had this in Cardiff for the quarterfinal four years ago where you had Ireland, Argentina, New Zealand and France all playing in Cardiff one day after another. And like Cardiff City Centre at the best of times, as you know, is a bit crazy. Yeah. But that Saturday night was just unbelievable to have so many people from so many different parts of the world have you got a sense that people are coming together have, are there many Irish supporters on the ground and are, are people mingling uh, not yet there is no sense at all actually that the fans aren't here and uh, like I'm just being completely truthful there because it is something that uh, a lot of the other journalists as well have been looking for to try and get a bit of uh, fan noise and fan reaction and stuff and people are struggling to actually capture that at this point. So it is kind of speculative, but like, I mean, like somebody made a point earlier on that perhaps the clientele of people who are actually coming to Japan as Ireland fans are people maybe later in their life, that they've made their money, that this is a trip of a lifetime sort of thing, uh, that, that they're traveling all the way over here, they might be down. In no one Shane context, is like they're probably 28. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Essentially what you're saying yeah. is they're not going to be serenading nuns on the train. <laughs> <laughs> essentially, essentially, J judging this by some sort of uh, Lille idea or, uh, uh, or anything like that, it's just not going to happen. Um, that, 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 is, that, that is not the way it's going to happen for the, for the rugby fan. Like, this isn't Cardiff, as you say. This is a long, long uh, way away from home. So I think we will see Ireland fans, uh, plenty full amounts of them over the next couple of days. They're probably all just doing countryside things and out by the sea or something like that today. And uh, they'll come in and actually get the rugby on Sunday. Tonight now, when we have uh, Japan against uh, Russia, uh, like, I, I think... Perhaps the city centre in Tokyo is where the, the remnants of those celebrations will go with the home side, do the job. But tomorrow it'll be, it'll be all down here in Yokohama. But to be honest with you, to answer your question, haven't seen too many random Irish fans uh, knocking around. Saw one guy in an IRFU t shirt there uh, yesterday. That wasn't the social media. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, that's been about it. Uh, that's, that's been the extent of it. But uh, I'll, be, I'll be down here tomorrow. I'm. Uh, 
I, I might splash out on a New Zealand South Africa ticket and uh, I'll be down here again obviously Sunday working at uh, the Ireland game so uh, we'll have a look around that but I would imagine now it's going to start today and tomorrow the influx of green uh, jerseys around this town. I've taken your advice on and I've googled is Japan big and I hate to piss on your chips here but it's only the 62nd biggest country on the planet. I said Tokyo really didn't I? Oh did you say Tokyo? Uh, no he actually said is Japan, yeah, I googled your googled is Japan is big. Tokyo big. They also they yeah, yeah. Well, let's look at let's let's give it a go and see what happens. Um, it's regarded as the biggest city in the world. So uh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is he not in Yokohama though? I take my pisgator chips back. Um, no, no Yokohama. Uh, not in Tokyo. Okay. But, uh, um, Yokohama is, is where everybody is. Right. Oh, and stellar work already this morning. We'll talk to you in a bit. Thanks, million. See you in a bit. Come on, on Shane, live there from Yokohama, getting on swimmingly by all accounts. He's looking fresh and jaunty. Jaunty? Jaunty. It's a sort of Kerry word, is it? Probably. Fire jaunting, ease. is that what they do around jaunty. Killarney? No, that's, they're the, what are they called? What do you call them? Is that not called jaunting? What do you call those lads? The fellows and the horses and the traps. Huh? No, javelin. <laughs> javelin. <laughs> <laughs> javelin. <laughs> the production box is on fire this morning. It's definitely not javelin. Jaunting. I know that, that for sure. Called? Jarvies. Jarvies. Oh, Jarvies. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, look at it. Um, right, I, there was something I wanted to mention there. I wanted to mention the team. I mean, the small important news of the team, if you've just joined us uh, on this Friday morning, in case you've missed out on it. The big news that uh, Jordan Larmer starts at uh, fullback. Andrew Conway gets the nod on the right wing and Jacob Stockdale on the left. The centres of Bundyaki and Gary Ringrose, Conor Murray and Johnny Sexton link up in the halfbacks. Across the back row, it's uh, Peter Romani. Uh, CJ Stander and Josh van der Fleer. It's Ian Henderson and James Ryan in the second row and Healy Best and Furlong across the front row. Now, I'm delighted to say that we're joined on the line by the, uh, by the former uh, Leinster centre, Brendan Mackey. Good morning to you, Brendan. Good morning. How are we? Good. Thanks, Millie, for taking the call. No what, bother at all. What do you make of that, uh, that selection of Larmer at fullback? Yeah, I think it's great. Um, you know, I think with him, uh, Conway, obviously, and Stockdale, it's unbelievably exciting. Um, you know, I think the Scots are going to have their work cut out from a uh, from a defensive point of view. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hopefully bodes really well for us. And the big concern, obviously, is uh, conversely on the Irish defensive side. That obviously between them, there's I think in and around fifty caps between that back three and some defensive question marks as well. And I know even Brian O'Driscoll uh, has been talking about Gary Ringrose in the last while and potentially some defensive frailties there. Uh, suddenly we're, we've gone from a situation of being pretty defensively sound and having a lot of experience to being pretty light maybe on both counts. Oh, I don't really know. Yeah, I think um, that's a fair point really but I think, um, you know, I think Andrew Conway is unbe- like, even though he, doesn't, he wouldn't have as many caps and wouldn't be experienced as Rob, he's almost like kind of like an old head really um, you know, in that, in that back three and I think he'll, he'll really organise things nicely. Um, and I think he's very calm. <clears throat> you know, he'll definitely help Gary inside him. Um, and then he'll obviously his, his his communication and talk to to Larmer will definitely help him. So I don't think that's a major that's a major worry to be honest, in my opinion. Anyway, in a way, this is a sort of back three Irish fans have been calling out for over recent years. Incredibly exciting. Alan Quinlan was saying, listen, there are three players who love to attack, and if the game becomes unstructured, three players who can really take advantage of that. I guess the question is. Can they play the way Joe Schmidt wants to play? And the way Joe Schmidt wants to play, does that bring the best out of those three players? If he wants a very structured, rigid game plan that's quite often no-risk rugby, does that suit the three of those? Or do you think actually Schmidt, with the injuries, changes his ways and gives them a bit more freedom? Uh, well, I think Schmidt will probably say some. You know, you, you, you have to go out and play your own game. And, and that's definitely the three of those. Their own game is to, you know, is to take people on. Is to is to try and express themselves, but obviously do you know do the right things? You know, kick when kick when you have to kick and that sort of thing. But I think you know in the last twenty minutes, cause conditions will be warm and stuff like that. It'll be it'll be ideal for those three lads, and you know, like uh, all three of them can step st- step fellas in a phone box. So, uh, Richie Murphy was talking during the week. He was put up in front of the press. Brandon, I don't know if it's a, if it was a press conference you saw. Uh, assumingly, you've got a life, and you probably didn't. <laughs> um, he was talking. Well, talking about Andrew Conway and saying that he's been around for over three years and that he's, uh, knows, he knows the system. So even though either himself or Larmer, depending on which one was picked, they've only got four and two starts uh, each in that full, full back position. He was talking about them knowing the systems because they've been around. But there is a big difference, obviously, between 
knowing the systems and actually actually having that frontline experience of playing them. Yeah, of course there is, and, and I think um, you know, obviously they've they both played in big European games, and but I think there's there's nothing like playing in a big international, you know, and open a game of a World Cup. But I I, I really do believe, um, you know, I don't know. Jordan Armour personally, but but no and Andrew personally, I think, you know, it's a challenge that he'll he'll absolutely relish. And like you said, he's been around three years, he's been knocking on the door uh for the last while. Um so I think, you know, from a from a, from a mental point of view, he's he's kind of definitely, definitely prepared himself uh for this opportunity and one which you want to take with both hands. Talk to us about Andrew Conway. Uh, he's a guy that you you mentioned that you soldiered with when both of you were at Leinster. Talk to him talk to us about that and what that what, what will mean to him to be uh, starting this game on Sunday. Sorry, pardon? I, I just missed you there. Talk to us about uh, Andrew Conway getting the nod at, at 15 and a guy that you would know pretty well and what it will mean to him to be starting Ireland's first uh, World Cup game. Yeah, like the, the, the world, to be honest, absolutely everything to him. Um, you know, I think even when he was when he's school, you know, when, when um, you know, going back when I started playing with him, you know, when we were seven, seven or eight years old and, um, you know, the whole way up through, through Black Rock and then into Leinster and, I think he really he's really evolved his game. I think everyone, you know, knew and he that that he could beat anyone, you know, one on one, he could he could score one but I think he's added so much more to to his game and I think from the mental point of view as well, like he's he's evolved, you know, really well. Um and that's why, like you said, Richard Murphy said he's been he's been in there around the, the, the Irish scene for the last couple of years and um he probably hasn't got the the the, the caps that he should have gotten and stuff like that. So I think he'll he'll this means the absolute world to him, and he'll uh, he'll relish it. So what shock if he, uh, if, he if, if he was man of the match? Now? <laughs> when you look back and you talk about like you know each other since you were kids, and particularly your Black Rock years, and I think you won a senior cup together, and like a lot of star players have come through from Black Rock at a very young age, and were seen as superstars. Was he one of those when he was 16, 17 that everybody around knew was destined for the top? Or like he is twenty eight now. It's taken him quite a while this journey to get to this level. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember when his when his when his uh, when his parents would give him um, you know two hundred quid to go buy a pair of boots, and he'd uh, he'd go down to to, to Dunn stores or pennies, and I think he'd buy a pair for eight or nine quid, which probably weighed weighed about twenty kilos, and he'd pocket the rest, and <laughs> um, and he 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 he'd be uh, he'd be running around fellas with these twenty kilos um, wooden canoes on his feet, and I think that's when pretty people knew this guy's going to be pretty uh, pretty pretty special. So I think I think like you said, it's just. With the with the journey and stuff like that, I think that's just the way it's gone for him. And I think um, you know, the move to Munster was 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 you know ideal ideal timing um, for him. And I think he's like he's 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 grown into uh, he's really grown so much down there. Johnny Sexton's another guy that you you would know pretty well, Brendan, from your, both your days at Leinster as well. He's not obviously had the game time that he would have wanted coming into this game. What are your your thoughts on the freshness of Johnny Sexton, particularly given that it's the toughest game in the pool first up? Yeah, well, yeah, I think that's fine. You know, I think Johnny's, he's, he's just been, you know, he's, he's, he's the ultimate pro. He's been around for so long. I think he knows exactly, exactly what's going to be required from him and exactly what's going to be required from, from the team to go out and win on, on, on the weekend. So, um, and he's, he's so unbelievably tough. He's mentally incredibly resilient. So I think, uh, I think he, if, if he is blowing and with, after 60 minutes, I don't think, I don't think many people would know. Yeah, all right. And what are your your uh, expectations, Ireland, to get it done on Sunday? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, to get it done, to come out of the group, and then hopefully beat South Africa or the uh, or the Kiwis and the quarterfinal. Please God. All right, very good. Listen, Brendan Mack, and thanks for me for taking our call this morning. Enjoy the game. No bother at all. Cheers. No worries. Take thanks care. A lot. Yeah. So um, some excitement there. What about uh, the selection of that back three? No nerves whatsoever. I'm just uh, fascinated by Andrew Conway getting two hundred <laughs> quid for a pair. The, game with the rest of the money was the men. Enjoyed his life. Yeah. Was was he? I, I, we we'll have more time maybe again to delve deeper into that. Like, was he implying that he was somewhat scroungy? <laughs> like, has he got this massive back balance that his parents have been thinking? His parents are, you know, going. We've supported him every step of the way. Like, we invested huge money, and he's like, yeah, straight into my bank account. I wonder where the parents are not going. Why did you pick up what the cheap pennies booth? Where's our two hundred quid gone? <laughs> yeah. Where's the Adidas Predator we uh, set you off for? Uh, 22 9 on this Friday morning. We've Kevin Caban and Phil Thompson on the way. We're going to reflect on that weekend of uh, that week of football and look ahead to a pretty interesting weekend as well. First of all, here's the. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Jamie Wall, I think, uh, Tommy, if I'm right. It's the New Zealand. Uh, 
rugby writer Jamie Wall on the highlight of the weekend for neutrals. The All Blacks take it on the Springboks. He was speaking at our new uh, Rugby World Cup show with Neil Tracy, which you can catch at lunchtime across the Off the Ball channels. I think so, because uh, it, it has happened before in World Cups. We saw it in 1991, uh, we saw it in 2007, we saw it in 2011. Uh, teams uh, from the same, oh, teams who lost in the pool stages uh, making it through the final and two in the same pool. So, you know, it can happen. Um, I, I think that if the All Blacks do lose on Saturday, it'll be a bit of a shock uh, to New Zealand rugby fans. At, uh, whoever they do play in the quarters, they would have ended up having to play anyway. Uh, so it's, uh, it's it's not that big a deal. And uh, Steve Hansen actually admitted as much uh, during the week. He said it's uh, uh, it's not the end of the world, which is about as close as you can get to him downplaying the importance of a World Cup game, I guess. Yeah, that's uh, Jamie Wall, the New Zealand version, um, chatting to Neil on the very first of our Rugby World Cup shows, which will air throughout the uh, tournament in a brand new set as well. So it's uh, very exciting. Where is this brand new set? It's another Paul Scott. Wow. Yeah. Very impressive. Uh, um, so Neil and Will were on duty yesterday and we'll plenty more of that over the next while. Uh, an interesting weekend of European football, obviously some uh, surprising results maybe in some regard or maybe not surprising. No, I think you'd have to say surprising considering neither of last Year's finalists, Liverpool or Spurs won. Manchester City were the only one of the English teams to yeah. win in the Champions League. Uh, like th and also, like Real Madrid absolutely battered by Paris Saint-Germain. I watched Atletico Madrid against Juventus, which the quality, particularly in the second half, I thought was, if it was a Champions League semi-final, it wouldn't have looked out of place. Okay. And while Juventus maybe don't have the quality, which seems a strange thing to say, considering some of the players they have, I just think the steel of Atletico Madrid, I would almost have them... Probably his third favourites after Manchester City and Liverpool. Well, was, Kenny was watching that game on when we were chatting to him on mm. uh, Wednesday night. And uh, needless to say, he just had some issues with the defensive qualities of. Without question, the first half defensively, Atletico Madrid were very poor, and they've lost three of their regular back four. Mm. In particular, Diego Godin, who's obviously just this totemic figure at the back for them for years. But Diego Simeone, you do feel it's almost the style of defending, that he can mould defenders into what he wants. Like Kieran Trippier playing it right back, certainly caught out on a couple of occasions. Can he get to the level? I just, like, I have so much faith in what Diego, Diego Simeone can do in terms of putting a side together. And like, Barcelona have big issues at the moment. Real Madrid have a lot of problems. Paris Saint-Germain, you would not stake your life on ever. That's why I would just have Atletico with some sort of proven European pedigree. And Diego Costa, who hasn't done a huge amount in La Liga since he went back to Atletico Madrid. There's something about these European nights. He just has a bit of fire in him. He's like, mm. It's the nasty Diego Costa that we used to see at Chelsea. Yeah. Kevin Caban's obviously his leading chairman, mm -hmm. and we're going to get to him in just a second. But first, before that, Phil, Thompson's, uh, Phil Thompson joins us on the line. Good morning to you, Phil. Good morning, guys. You're all right. How much of a concern was the performance by uh, Liverpool during the week for you? Um, it wasn't as, as concerning as it was last year because we were absolutely atrocious last year when we played Napoli. This was far better, and I think um, I think anybody watching the game, I think I think everybody would agree that it was a it was a draw all over it. Yeah, the go two goalkeepers made a couple of outstanding saves, um, but I thought that there was really nothing in the game, and, and it was at the time when I thought Liverpool had actually looked the more likely to win, probably the last 20 minutes, because they looked out on the feet. They were the ones who, who were tired, going down with cramp. Um, so, nothing too much. I, I was more than pleased when I seen the fixtures come out, and Napoli away was the first one, and it gives us five games to get things right. Yeah. We had Mark Lawrence on on Wednesday night, and he was talking about, we were discussing whether it was a systems failure or just a couple of individual errors. Sounds like you're also in the individual errors camp. Yeah, it was in individual errors. Um, Andy Robertson, who's been absolutely terrific. Uh, I think if he'd have gone over, which a lot of them do, um, as they did in the Chelsea game and had a look at the halfway line, I think he, he on the, the way of caution that it, it wasn't. It was the attacker who was making Callahan, who was making contact with Andy Robertson and not the other way round. Um, and then the other one, Van Dijk, when he told poked it back, I, I think obviously that was an error by him, which is unfortunate. But Andy Robertson and Adrian, the both of them thought that each other was going to go for it. 
and are late on one. It, it often happens in games. Now, I'm not too concerned, guys, because I, th- I thought it was a, it was a decent in, in a hostile atmosphere. I thought it was a decent display. And Liverpool created chances and missed a lot of chances. And one of the big ones, Phil, was that opportunity at the end on the breakaway where Sadio Mane has the opportunity to slide it through to Mo Salah, over hits the pass. Like you see Liverpool finish off those opportunities 99 times out of 100. But in the context of what's been going on between Mane Absolutely. and Salah, obviously people read a little bit more into it. And there was obviously the issue after the Burnley game where Mane really wasn't happy with Salah not passing him the ball and whether there were opportunities where Salah was being a little bit greedy. Like, would you have any concerns that there is some sort of a breakdown in trust between Mane and Salah? I think at the, at the, at the initial time there was. Um, but being in dress rooms, being part of this kind of thing, you get over it. And, and it is, it's a little tantrum. Your, your heart's beating a bit faster. You're a little bit angry about what's happened. But I do think it had an impact on, on that particular incident because I think um, Sadio going through, I do think he should have gone straight for goal because with his pace, it, it took him straight in. But listen, it was quite good defending because the lad has got two on one. So he's putting himself in between and he's saying, right, what do we do? Trying to make it it's so that... Um, I'm going to try and get him to put in my favour, which is where he wanted to go, because it was a pass to Salah, and he overhit it. And that was a problem on the on the night, guys, that I thought Liverpool's final ball on the night was absolutely dreadful. The final touch around the box and in the box was absolutely dreadful. Um, but I don't think anything like that it has to do with the spat that uh, Salah and Mane had had. But that particular incident... I think because he had a little bit of a time to think, it went through his mind, and I have to pass it to um, to Mo. I've got to give it to Mo because of all this talk, and he overhit it. Yeah, like it, it obviously can be a very positive thing that you have players on the pitch calling each other to account. But on the other hand, there was that incident. There was Henderson, and it might have been Mane at one point as well. They were having a similar goal at each other. Van Dijk was certainly uh, pretty. Tetchy, I suppose, to put it that way. It can be something that also can seep into a culture of a football team in a negative sense. It could do. Listen, if we're, if we're nitpicking at, at little things like this, uh, the, the the superb start, we could, on the flip side, this is sort of one defeat, which, as I say, I think a draw would have been easily a fair result. Both sides would have accepted that. But the excellent start, the you know 100% start they've had in the Premier League can't be dismissed. Uh, just by a little spot like this. I quite enjoy it when players on the pitch are having a little bit of a go at each other. If if you're worth your salt, you just take that and you get on with it. And um, if Van Dijk's having a go at me, Henderson's having a go at me, Marnie's having a go at somebody, I don't think that's I think that's quite healthy. I'd rather people care than not care and all this false stuff like shaking fists when the camera comes on them and go, oh, come on, lads, go. And that, that to me just absolutely gets to me. Yeah. I know uh, Nathan here beside me always had a soft spot for Vincent Company in that, <laughs> <laughs> in that regard. It is incredible that actually, particularly now where there's screens in every ground, and when you, you notice it more when you're actually watching on television. So after an incident, you'll always see the players looking up to the screen mm. and their reaction might change very quickly when they notice they're on the screen. Yeah, they do, don't they? they you know, they, they brush the hairstyles back, they, particularly when it is a, a live game and they've had a, a new piece. Mind you, I can't go on about haircuts with my perm, can I? Um, but they do, they, they do actually look up and they, and they quite enjoy looking at themselves. I, I, I quite wonder they doing looking up there. Mm. And they should be concentrating on the match. But I suppose some of these screens are absolutely ginormous. Mm. So it does take the focus off the game. Um, but it's there. It's there for a reason. Of these incidents that are happening with the VAR, which still absolutely confuses me. I suppose that's one for another day. Yeah, Phil. Looking ahead to Sunday, it's a game that's live here and off the ball. Uh, Chelsea against Liverpool at the Bridge. Nathan will be there alongside Brian Kerr. Your thoughts on? I mean, th- this these Chelsea kids won't have enough for surely for this experienced Liverpool side. Well, I mean, I did the game. I did the game, um, I did the game against Wolverhampton Wanderers for Chelsea. And for half an hour, it was one of the worst Premier League games that I'd seen. There wasn't a shot, there wasn't a tackle, there wasn't, there was nothing done. It was a throw-in. And then it just burst into life. Tamori scores from about 25. Yeah, it seems like we might have lost our connection to Phil Thompson there. Um, 
we'll uh, we'll see if we can get fit back in the line. It's um, it does look it does look as if everything is in Liverpool's favour. I would think on Sunday. Yeah, you look at it on all recent form and the way the two teams set up. In fact, you look at this and Liverpool will be licking their lips at the way Chelsea play, that they won't sit back, that Frank Lampard doesn't seem to have that tactical side. I think it's a lot of pressure actually on Frank Lampard in this game to go and prove himself that he can set up the team defensively Mm. because you can't do anything else. If they go and try and match Liverpool and beat them in a game of football, they could find themselves getting absolutely battered. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I think I think it's the way of I think Frank's a little bit confused. Starts off with four at the back, really they weren't good enough um, in that respect, and then he, he changed to go like for like against Wolves, and it worked. He had a very very good performance, and he, he stuck with that in midweek. Uh, and to me, still does not that defence is not good enough. Rudiger is the best defender, and he's not good enough. And you're quite right; he wants players to change. Uh, Kovacic. And Jorginho, who Kovacic and Jorginho, who are normally sort of defensive, he wants them to go forward. Frank is demanding them to change the way they play. I do think it will play into Liverpool's hands. And that at home, they have to go and attack Liverpool. Yeah, and your expectations for the outcome? I do think Liverpool will win. I think it will be very, very tight. Um, and it'll be interesting, because I think Mason Mount might be possibly be fit now and his ankle injury looked really bad but this just talk about him if he plays I think he's a wonderful player and he will help them in the offensive side but uh, I do think Liverpool will, will come out winners 2-1 yeah, Alright Phil thanks many for taking the call as always Thanks guys my pleasure Cheers Phil Thompson on the line there ahead of that uh, Chelsea-Liverpool game at the weekend like did where there's been a lot of chatter about the touchiness between some of those Liverpool players and like mm. you were talking in detail about the Mane uh, Salah spat like it'll all be brushed over results obviously is the is the thing like if Liverpool win that game nobody's really talking about it. everybody's saying what a positive thing is that in the middle of this game all these players are holding each other to account but it's when things start to go slightly the other way it becomes a bit more of a challenge. I think it's the fact that it's Salah and Mane because those two players probably link up more than any two players in the league. Like there's constantly situations where one of them finds themselves in the penalty area, mm. there's a shot on, but the other one is a really good outlet. And you don't want what happened the last night where, if, as Phil says, and he thinks that it almost got into Sadio Mane's head of, the right thing for Sadio Mane to do is just put on the afterburners, fly around the defender and take the shot on. But in his head, he's, well, I've just made this huge incident of mm. him not passing me the ball, I better pass him the ball, and he overhits it in the end. Like, they're absolutely flying in the Premier League. I don't want to be uh, misquoting Randy Whelan, but it did feel in commentary as if he was suggesting that it was maybe overhit deliberately. Oh. Like, if that was the case, Liverpool are screwed. Mm. Absolutely screwed. Like if you've it that did sort seem of like I watched it back I, once it, when he said that I rewound it just to watch it back and for a professional footballer it did seem to be unbelievably over it overcome. was but the, I think that entire final couple of seconds of the move just didn't make any sense and again maybe feeds into what Phil was saying because he's running at full speed both of them are running at full speed these are two unbelievably technically gifted players yeah. who can run with the ball at their feet that suddenly Mane slows right down and there was an opportunity to pass the ball, and he slows down even further to the extent that by the time he passes the ball, he's pretty much statuesque, and then massively overhits it. Like, if what Ronnie is saying, if there's any shred of truth in that, Liverpool have a That's enormous a problem, issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can't see it. I think they get themselves into so many positions to score during games that there'll be enough goals to go around. Both of them scored what 22 last season. They were joint top scorers in the Premier League. You wouldn't be surprised if it was something similar. But there was chat at the end of last season as well, wasn't there? When one or the other of them had got in a goal at some point, the other one was maybe a bit more free, and they were like, "Ooh, does he pass it or does he?" Hang but on? they've always been like that. That's the, like that's the point that Liverpool probably create more chances than any other side, and those two mm. are always in positions because of the way they play, cutting in from the two sides. You'll see Salah cutting in from the left, loves to bend it in with his left foot. We're actually just playing the slide rule ball across to Mane. It might be the better option, yeah. but it's Mo Salah who you know can smack them in from there. What's going to happen is in about 20 years you're going to have two forwards who've played for a high-profile club uh, having a high-profile public spat about how they never really got on <laughs> and one of them wasn't really trying. It's what I, that's my prediction. Well, there's certainly no precedent for such a thing <laughs> happening. John Giles, uh, Kevin Cabana, the way John Giles uh, was uh, on the show last night and had an interesting observation about Virgil van Dijk's on-field demeanour. I think he's a terrific player, probably the best defender in the world, but he's, I find him very, very arrogant. And even last night, he wasn't accepting the responsibility. Like, I see him playing in matches and, uh, like, there's nothing on. 
and he's shake doing his hands and you know like where where are all these guys? It was his fault. The goal was his fault last night. But he was still pointing at somebody. He's a terrific player, but I don't like that in a player because I think, it, 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 in my opinion, you should never do anything on the pitch, uh, Richie, mm. that is degrading your own players or having a go at them. You can say it next to them. You know, if you're on the pitch and you, you're not agree, you can say, nobody, the crowd don't know about it. Yeah. But when you're doing that, then it's... The optics of it are quite poor. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't like it. I think he's a terrific player. Probably he's one of the best defenders in the world in that. But, uh, and, and all great players have an arrogance about them. All right. And he has that, which is, which that's confidence in that. But definitely, anytime I see him make a mistake, I haven't seen him hold his hands up yet. Mm. It's been somebody else. But anyway, that's Liverpool. Was there, Actually, was there, I thought Liverpool played quite well. Quite well, well at, I was just going to ask you, is there cause for concern there, given no, the fact that... No, 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 no. John not impressed with Virgil van Dijk? I think he's correct that Virgil van Dijk is arrogant, but he also said, John, I think, and the headline is about the arrogance, but he did say he is the best defender in the world. And part of the reason he is, I think, is because of that arrogance. The way he holds himself, he just yeah. struts around the pitch like, I am the man. Uh, the Scotland team is in. We're going to bring it to you in just a few minutes. But before that, Kevin Kilbane, good morning to you. Good morning, Adrian. How are you keeping? What part of the world are you in? I'm in Dublin. Good man. How was the Mason Greenwood? Is the big story from the game last night? Yeah, uh, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the greatest of games. I think United dominated uh, the game really. And, and in fairness, Greenwood didn't have the greatest of games himself. I think he he looked like he was out outpowered a lot of the time. He, he probably didn't look strong enough physically to deal with uh, with Astana at times. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in the lead-up to the game said he's the best finisher that he's seen. And um, it was a really good finish on his weaker right foot. He went for power through the goalkeeper's leg. So it was a good finish. But I heard that comment. That? And I, is that just a load of nonsense? I heard that comment and I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it probably was a lot of nonsense. It's, it's probably something to give the, the, the young lad a little bit of confidence, I would imagine, though, really. But... Um, he took his goal well. That's the thing. He's obviously a very good finisher, but we've we've heard that comment from, or we've heard that comment about so many different players over the years, haven't we? And I, I, I just think it was maybe a bit of a throwaway line from Solskjaer. I think in the lead up to the game, when he was asked the question about who was going to be starting the game, and a lot of those youngsters did start. Just let me ask you one more on on Mason Greenwood. He's been obviously at the club uh, since he was six. I heard Marcus Rashford talk about him uh, glowingly afterwards as well, and how he can, you know, when you come through that structure from that age, how you actually get very used to dealing with the pressure outside of the goal. How was he? No, that's what I'm saying. He, I, I said before he, he actually struggled overall. Um, his hold up play wasn't the greatest, but you have to give him the leeway that he's a what 17, 18 year old kid that, that, mm. that's coming into the fray there last night and he's uh, he hasn't got a lot of game time on, on his hands and Astana played it in a way Adrian where they went to United and really attacked they had a, they had a few moments in the game where they maybe capitalised on a couple of errors from Phil Jones but when, when a lot of the balls were being fired into Greenwood he was losing possession that was the same for Enzo Gomez uh, for Chong Rashford did okay. I think he was one that was trying to make it happen for United. But I think in in general, United's front three or four players, their attacking players, misfired, I felt, overall in the night. Those quotes from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer about Mason Greenwood very much following a pattern of recent weeks of talking up these young players. And it does feel as though it's very much a PR strategy, this sort of battle for hearts and minds of United supporters of, oh, the future has never looked better. And I'm giving these players a chance. Where... The reality is United need to deliver this season. That Solskjaer yeah. can push it all he wants into, I'm the best man to develop these young players in the Manchester United way. I, you wonder how long he can get away with that. Yeah, good morning, Adrian. Great to see you in studio. Um, I'm Nathan. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, no, I think... Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of PR spin, I think, coming from him at the moment, isn't there, because of that. I think he recognises that his team's in a bit of a hole. They're not playing great football going forward. I think what he has done, I think in the, in the last month or so, with the way that things are going for them, United look really poor at the back. I think he's just tried to solidify them defensively, make them a little bit more difficult to beat. And don't concede. Look, if we're going to win a game, lads, we can't be going through matches. We're going to have to score two and three goals to win a match. We have to get clean sheets, right? So fair play to him for doing that. But I, 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 de I genuinely think that the young players are probably not of the level of one or two other clubs' young players. I do think that there's maybe several other teams that have got better younger, or, or certainly a, a lot more prominent younger players that, that are playing at under-21 level for the country, that are certainly playing 
at a really good level. And I think that's where, where United are. United are just in a position at the moment where, you, where you're watching them thinking, look, it's it, the, the Neely men rather than actually players that's going to step in, these young players I'm talking, where they're going to be players that's going to step in. And Greenwood, is he, is he, going, to go, is he going to be a, a top striker for United in years to come? Hopefully, yes. But at the moment, he doesn't look the player that's going to be a player that's going to really step up and score. 15, 20 goals. He's, he's certainly not the level of Tammy Abraham at the moment, no. Like we always talk about it, Nathan has started coaching it in a way that, uh, like, this is, needs most almost from a United point of view that they have been left almost with no other option and they have to start bringing these players through. And you've mentioned Chelsea, and there's a lot of the same thing happening there. But, like, suddenly those players are starting to find, sign five year deals at five times the amount of money, and certainly, suddenly there's this value on them that there wouldn't have been if Chelsea didn't have had that ban that yeah. they would have brought players in. Like, it's almost surprising in some ways that these top clubs aren't acknowledging the amazing, even if you just look at them as commodities, uh, that they have in their books. And even, even you know, as I said, they wouldn't have got those opportunities if the ban wasn't in place or you know, Greenwood wouldn't be getting that opportunity if United had bought a bunch of players to... Like, that it's not more of a policy that these clubs aren't trying to get those uh, players involved um, just as part of their policy. It's surprising to yeah, me. Yeah, no, I know it, it, it isn't. We, uh, we've we've heard of the of the talent uh, that's been around Man City and Chelsea, especially those two have been the top youth teams over the last ten years, especially Chelsea, and that has been the criticism that's been labelled against Conte, Mourinho, you name the manager of the, the manager in Chelsea over the last ten years, who, who's who's been able to develop this this talent, and no one has been able to develop them. So you're right, it has been needs most this, this year this year for Chelsea. City have got an amazing pool of talent within their within their ranks as well. Yet there's maybe only Phil Foden that's around the first team now. That that is it. There's nobody else that's going to be breaking through into City's first team. And you mentioned there about maybe recognizing the value Chelsea and City, especially more so Chelsea, have used the youth team as a way to 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 end, or, or to finance the, the, the youth department. If they've, they've signed the best young players in Europe or and the world, and they're selling players on for big money at youth level, and that's what they've done. And they're Maybe they say we're United. I, I don't think I don't see the players that I've seen come breaking through for United in the last year, year eighteen months or so, at the level that I've seen Chelsea and Man City players. No, and maybe maybe even one or two other players that have been been breaking through at other clubs as well. Um, they're not at that level, but that's where United are. United maybe have the, the same needs. Most don't sign players. Give give the players a break. Give them some game time, and hopefully it works out for you. That's the way it is for United. It, it seems to me at the moment, again with United, it's just a little bit. We're, we're trying to get to the level. We're, we're trying without necessarily having having the tools to do so. We've seen an awful lot of very young, exciting, attacking players in European football this week. Just last night I was working on the PSV Eindhoven game. Daniel Malin, 20 years of age, scored five at the weekend in the Eredivisie for PSV. Scored again last night in their win over Sporting Lisbon. Like, lightning quick. A player who was actually at Arsenal, four years at Arsenal, and they let him go to PSV Eindhoven. And sort of player you can see returning to Arsenal for a big fee over the next while. You still have the likes of David Neres, who's only 22 at Ajax. Alfie Haaland's son scoring that hat trick for Salzburg during the week. Like this is the breathing ground, and probably always has been, I guess, that the finishing destination is the Premier League. But you do just wonder with what the likes of Mason Mount and Tammy Abraham have done this season. Like, should the Premier League clubs be trusting youth more often? Yes, in a word, yes, definitely, because the the, the talent has always been there, and it's because the Premier League has such a. a, a uses or makes it easy, uh, more important to go out and sign the best players around and and they'd rather the way the way the, the way that it is it's almost as if they you know we, we see stepping stones you mentioned that a lot of the players there that have, that have gone on and done well they'd rather go they'd rather sign a player or even allow another team to sign a player so they can play 50 games and then they'd rather pay 40 million for them once they're proven rather than go I'll tell you what we go on, if we're going to sign a player that's one of the best in European football uh, at youth level, we'll go and pay five or six million for them. But give him that chance. You only need to look at Kevin De Bruyne, Mo Salah, all, all these players that come out of good clubs when they were younger. Romelu Lukaku would have been would have been another one that was signed by Chelsea. Didn't necessarily get great game time, sent out on loan. There's so many that have come through the structures at Chelsea and various other clubs that haven't been given the the, uh, the game time, haven't been given the chance. When clearly they have the talent, clearly they do, and they probably need 15 games under the belt, and that's what Mason Mount will get. That's what Tammy Abraham will get, and that's only down to necessity, or, or, or because they've got no other option. Chelsea, that's why they're doing it. They probably wouldn't have done that 
if if Lampard had had what 200 million, 300 million to spend, I think his priority would have been go out and sign a striker, go and sign a player that's going to go and get me 25 goals. Probably gone sign a midfield, a creative midfield with Hazard leaving, but they weren't able to do it. So I think they've given Mount a chance, they've given them a chance, and as I said, the talent has been there. But that's what's affecting maybe us. Uh, uh, it's affecting Ireland because the young lads aren't getting chances anymore. Because that it's that in, uh, they've they've used the the, um, the method of just going out to sign the best around. That's what's having the knock on effect, and the and the and the, and the effect is is across. Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and uh, and of course it's affected England as well over the years, and that's where we are. But England, of course, have ploughed that much money. The Premier League have ploughed so much money into the system since I think about 2011, since the E Triple P system came in. Since that system has come in, they've ploughed so much money into into youth football. That's where England are getting the benefits now at under 21, under 19s, and, and senior international level. English football is probably slightly changing in the moment as well as that we see the likes of Jaden Sancho going to Borussia Dortmund a lot of their young players from the big academies are starting to experience European football because it is one of the massive benefits so in England players go from the Premier League down to the Championship a very similar style of football in Ireland we know this all our players go to Championship clubs the one style of football you look at what young players at the likes of Lille at PSV even clubs further down the European rankings the experience they're getting of going up against the likes of a Sporting Lisbon or like a continental different style of football pretty much every time you play like what yeah. that must do for your footballing education rather than championship football 100 miles an hour like learning how to play on the biggest stage at a very young age yeah, like it's something that we ex experimenting is not a is not a thing that that's probably the fundamental reason behind all of this conversation mm. that we've just been having for the last whatever number of minutes about giving youth its chance that the clubs don't want to take the chance that's they want to be assured of somebody that can come in they're happy to be assured of somebody that can come in and score 15 goals rather than take a chance on somebody they think might be able to score 25. Yeah, right. And like Kevin has spoken proven. about Tammy Abraham, who now has what scored seven goals in his last three Premier League games. Yeah. The criticism he took after the first day of the season against Manchester yeah. United, we were there at Old Trafford. Like he hit the post after yeah. four minutes against United. That goes in. Like, God knows how that game would have gone for both clubs. Yeah. But like the level of stick because he was a young English player who had a bad time at Swansea was totally disproportionate to what a player should get. So, like that, probably is part of the problem as well. That everybody is ultra critical of these younger players, the supporters as much as anybody. Yeah. So they talk about wanting to give a chance, but they don't actually want to do it in practice. Kev, will you talk to us about obviously the Chelsea Liverpool game on Sunday is a big part of our focus. We've got our A commentary team on that one. Nathan's going to be there alongside Brian Kerr for the four thirty. No doubt. First, no first, doubt. first choice commentary team. Um, on duty, the penalty situation during the week, and it's not really so much the penalty itself because I mean Ross Barkley is the we're told designated penalty taker, and he's on the bench. Personally, I have no issue with that. It's he's doesn't he's not uh, deemed good enough to start, but it doesn't mean that he's not the best penalty taker in the squad. So I wouldn't have any huge issue with that. But you do have this situation again where you have three players on the pitch debating about who should be taking this penalty. And for me, it comes back to Frank Lampard, and clearly there was a lack of clarity about who should be. The main penalty taker is this just some? Is this just another? We need to give, we need to cut Lampard a bit of slack because he's still just cutting his teeth on it. Or is does it does it point to something a bit greater issue there? Oh, no, it's not such a greater issue, but I just don't understand. Solskjaer said it, of course, this year with Pogba and and um, and Rashford. The level of preparation, the level of detail that that that, that managers are going to now getting the teams prepared. I, I find it amazing that they're coming out afterwards, and and there's and there's some sort of um, some sort of I don't know concern over who's going to be taking the penalties. It, it, it's crazy to me because, as I say, the level of detail that's there, they have to get it in place and make sure he's my penalty taker. That's it. If your man's not on the pitch, like whoever it would be, then somebody else is taking the penalties. It, it's it's naturally always been the case. There's a penalty taker, one designated taker. If there's if he's not on the pitch, then I suppose it's a bit of a different argument, but. It's it's always been the case. It's crazy. It's crazy that uh, that things are going the way or that it's been going like this even with Lampard. I think Lampard. I mean, I think Solskjaer maybe. Well, he, I think he waffled a little bit really himself when he was talking about Pogba and uh, and Rashford. There was there's one penalty taker in my mind, and that's it. Yeah. Just before you go, in a word, uh, Liverpool or Chelsea? Liverpool. I think Liverpool win it. I think they're, they're, they're on form and uh, I can't see them going down there and not scoring. I think they'll win the game. Yeah, Lampard could be on 10 ice. We shall see. Kev, thanks a million as always for taking the call. Cheers.
be back in studio next week, hopefully, anyway, with the, with the proper presenters, anyway. Good luck. <laughs> all the best. All the best. Wow. Well, we haven't seen all the best, he says. <laughs> We're wrapped it up. We haven't seen you so long, can we? Jesus. Everybody Jesus. looks like a cold Jesus. shoulder there, isn't he? Unbelievable. Bloody hell. Sort of level of abuse. Wow. Well, who are these proper presenters he's talking <laughs> yeah. about? Are you not one of them? Is that well, a... the fact that he has attempted to come into studio was a shock to me. Yeah, I haven't I, seen I, him in here I in about said, six months. I said Lampard was skating on thin ice, I can tell you something. Oh. Come on as well, yeah. Uh, we're going back to Owen Shane in just a couple of minutes' time where he's going to tell us what's happening in the... Uh, in fact, we can bring him in now. A shady-looking, even shadier than Hello, usual. darkness, Owen my old Shane. friend. Back here. Fine. Yeah, no, you're no. lying shy, Owen. Find, find uh, the internet, on. It's uh, modern light. technology. Get a light on the internet. <laughs> Electricity <laughs> and internet, on. <laughs> I mean, you're only one of the most technologically advanced nations on the planet. Yeah. Only 62nd biggest geographically, though, off the Six, top of my head. But Tokyo, I, from what I understand, is the biggest city in the world? I think it's, it's, it's certainly it's spoken about in those, in those terms, anyway. Certainly so, getting there. According to Google. What's your, uh, what's your match day plan? Everyone, uh, uh, because it's early morning. Yeah. So, like, the last experience we have of this was 2002 World Cup. Yeah. I was a college student back then. Took the month off. Oh, it's a different buzz. Did a lot of the all-nighters. Fell asleep halfway through Brazil against England. <laughs> right. Totally missed uh, Ronaldinho's goal. Yeah. Had no idea what had happened. Obviously, there was no rewind uh, record it back in uh, those talent. days. Like quarter to eight on a Sunday I'm morning. Gonna, I'm, Just a relaxing breakfast. I'm going to host breakfast. That's what I'm doing. You're hosting it. Yeah. How many people are coming around for breakfast? I don't know. There could be eight or ten. What? Yeah. Thanks for the invite. Listen, if you're not going to bring, bring, well, no, bring listen, family, no, bring no. the family, the open, no, open house. Well, I'm, I'm going away to Liverpool against Chelsea, ah, so but, I, like, but I might send the family. They're, they're, yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> they're the looking for something to do. do. Owen, are you there? What's the crack? You can hear me now. That's, I can hear you now, man. That's much better. Um, what have you got for us? The Japan, uh, uh, Yokohama, of the local newspapers, is that what, you're, what, we're, what we're doing here? That is it. We're going to start with the newspaper we didn't get to last week. It is uh, the Japan Times. It is the biggest English-speaking newspaper in the world. Bit of a humble brag here. I appeared in the Japan Times video last weekend. I'm a bit of a celebrity now. No big deal. That's I saw Japan it, yeah. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't uh, be bragging too much about page, it. Front page story is uh, Japan welcomes nations for Rugby World Cup. Uh, the vision for the tournament is all about this being an opportunity to go to sport, not just in Japan, but in Asia. It's starting to dominate proceedings. We've got Rory Best in the Japan Times, actually. Uh, he's a couple of pages in. Uh, we can see him here with uh, a Seymour wrestler. Uh, the Ireland team obviously went down uh, to see to meet up with them uh, the other day. There he is pictured with uh, a Seymour champ, uh, a nice Seymour picture there uh, right beside him. Uh, and then we've got uh, the first uh, Japan uh, game dominating proceedings when it comes to actual rugby stories. Brave Blossoms admit they are nervous and excited to play Japan. Japan making final preparations uh, for their first game. Uh, across the, the tabloids, they're kind of in broad sheet shape here uh, in Japan, but they're very, very colorful uh, with these uh, newspapers as we kind of displayed the other day. Uh, they're all kind of starting with uh, the World Cup fever as well. It's, uh, today is the first day where it is kind of the main story on a lot of the back pages. We we'll start with this particular publication. Uh, I'm not sure if one, but I don't know what it's called. I don't know what any of these are really called, to be honest with you. Uh, but this one here, you can see the brave blossoms uh, on the back page. There, we get a kind of a full spread of it here. Uh, training before the Russia game uh, yesterday, captain's run. They've also got a handy uh, four-page uh, supplements pull out where they've got these uh, massive heads of the players of the Japan-Russia game tonight on bodies. That is how they're animating proceedings. And inside. They've got uh, a breakdown, a tactical breakdown of how Japan managed to beat uh, South Africa four years ago. It is uh, the miracle, they call it, and that is how they've displayed that in, in that newspaper. I just a uh, quick look at some of the other back pages then again this morning. It's kind of the same story, to be honest with you, in terms of uh, the Rugby World Cup. Uh, we've got uh, preparations for Japan against Russia in this publication. That is their back story there. A nation trying to get behind their men. They said that there's only certain pockets of Japan uh, who are into rugby, so they're trying to jump up a bit more support, and uh, that is them in training yesterday as well. I'm not going to open these newspapers because it turns out I've bought newspapers that uh, contain a lot of softcore pornography, uh, but the, the back pages and a lot of the inside pages have uh, rugby, so there you go. We leave that there. <laughs> <laughs> leave it dangling on. What's the plan for the? Um, <laughs> what's the plan? <laughs> what's the plan? For, what time is it there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, quarter past five in the evening, Adrian. After, after I do this, I'll be getting on a train to Tokyo, Tokyo Stadium to watch uh, Japan wallop Russia. Calling it now, they're going to wallop Russia this evening. Are you expensing those newspapers? <laughs> I've never regretted asking a question more. 
<laughs> uh, on that note, and we'll be we'll be chatting to you no doubt tomorrow. And thanks, Millie, for all the work this morning. Fair play. Good luck. Come on, take it easy. The Scotland team Man. is in. Duncan Taylor and Sam Johnson are going to start together uh, in the midfield. We've been talking a lot about the un tested combinations from an Irish point of view or uh, inexperienced combinations. It's only the second time both of those are going to start in midfield uh, for Scotland, so uh, uh, perhaps an area that Ireland will be able to target. Ryan Wilson uh, gets the nod at number eight over Blade Thompson. Greg Laidlaw, um, uh, many people won't be surprised at that, but he does get in ahead of Ali Price at scrum half. Johnny Gray, uh, chosen in the second row, alongside Grant Gilchrist and Stuart McNally is going to captain uh, from hooker Stuart Hogg, obviously uh, gets the nod at uh, fullback. So that is the highlights from that. Uh, Tommy Seymour and um, Sean Maitland on the wings as well. They're the highlights. Uh, Finn Russell at 10. It's that, that sort of Russell, Hogg, Laidlaw triumvirate that is really key. Yeah. Th- well, again, we talk about the Irish depth, like the the uh, having Ali Price on the on the bench from a Scottish point of view as well is serious depth in a way at scrum half that we have never quite managed to get. Yeah. I know... Andy Dunn was in here earlier in the week and he's going to be on again over the course of the weekend. A huge fan of Finn Russell. Mm. You would wonder whether the weather conditions suit his style of rugby. I think the weather conditions are going to play into, forgetting about all of that, into Scotland's hands given our inexperienced back three. Like there, You just think there's more of a possibility of a mistake? Well, there's no doubt that if you're Gregor Townsend, you're going to have looked at that over Fireballs. the last one. You know that Rob Carney, you've known for a couple of weeks that Rob Carney is not going to play so what is your policy going to be? So I will be fascinated to see how Ireland cope with that. Will they sit a bit deeper maybe than they might normally do, that the, you might have a couple of support players back? What does that take away from our uh, potential attack? That's what I wonder what Joe Schmidt's message to Jordan Larmer is. Is it all I want you to do, and he knows what's coming, you know what's coming, I know what's coming, I want you to catch every single ball, and then I'm happy with your performance. Forget about the, you're an exciting attacking player. I don't care about that right now. If you make one mistake, it could kill our bloody tournament. Mm. Catch every ball. Yeah, like the, the reality is that, I know we spoke about it earlier on just in terms of the momentum of it, like no matter what happens against Scotland, it's somewhat irrelevant in the, in the ah. connotations point of view. Like, but what, so who do you want to get? Who, what, what do you want to happen in the... I don't care who we get. Well, like, see, there you go. Well, so I do think there's a possibility the that mental I, side of losing to Scotland it would be such that. a there hammer blow. There is that. Now, yeah. The flip of that, obviously, is that we've got into World Cup quarterfinals absolutely buzzing and haven't delivered. So maybe there's a expectations have been lowered to such an extent. Yeah. Been very negative. I suspect Joe Schmidt's pre-match talk to Jordan Arbor will be more positive than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't drop the effing ball. Uh, there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, right, we're going to be back with the sports news and Phil, o- Phil Egan in just a couple of minutes' time. First of all, Nathan, you've been speaking with Shane Duffy. Yes, I was over in Brighton just a few weeks ago. Lovely part of the world. Brighton, have you been? I have not been to oh, Brighton. The pier, for a night out, I believe. Is. The pier, now, there was a hurricane pretty much the day we were there. Right. But we still walked out to the edge of the pier. Whew, frightening experience. Just all wooden. You're looking down going, how safe could this really be? What would you have expected a pier? I, mean, I don't know. In modern technology, some sort of solid pier, I suppose, yeah, steel, enough. metal, something a bit safer. Anyways, Brighton's a great spot. Hipster heaven. You'd, You'd love have it. loved it. But anyways, I went over to chat to Shane Duffy uh, because we're running this series with the Irish Blood Transfusion Service. Last year we had uh, Dr. Alan Byrne in, the Irish team doctor, who was telling us the story of the night that Shane Duffy nearly died. Very young player, he was 19 years of age. This is almost a decade ago now. Involved in a sort of training game, was almost the Ireland C team against an Irish amateur team. Has this freak collision with goalkeeper and has, as all the medical staff say, a very freak, unique injury whereby there's a rupturing of the spleen, a rupturing of the aorta, very nearly dies ends up getting um, seven litres of blood. So very much aware, obviously, of the importance of blood donation. Yeah, let's take a look. I weren't worried. For some reason, I weren't worried. Because as as I said before, I didn't realise how severe it was. Mm. And then when I could start walking and jogging again, I thought, oh, I'm back, it's okay, like. But I weren't, so, um, yeah, I started more worrying when I was back early training, where I thought, oh, I don't feel right. In what way? Body mind, everything, where I felt like oh, I don't feel the same here. and Worried about getting injured again? or just No, I just felt physically, I felt were. like, well, I'm nowhere near like, the level I was at here. And, and, and me and Seamus always talk about it when we do. It's like, we'll never forget we were doing pre-season. And I came back far too early. And, and, and I just said to Seamus one day, like, 
I, I can't. They, he was doing a, like a light job, and I was 100 percent like, and I was like, no, I need to pull out here, and then I stopped for another couple of months then, but I'll never forget that. And as I said, it was, I was never worried until probably that stage where I was back training. I was what I've had injury before, maybe it takes a little bit of time. Mm. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts is back at the City West Convention Centre Dublin from the 6th to the 12th of October. See 32 of the biggest darting stars on the planet, including world number one Michael Van Gerwen, former Grand Prix champion Daryl Gurney, plus fan favourite Peter Wright. Your tickets now at Ticketmaster.ie and search darts. The 2019 Boyle Sports World Grand Prix Darts at City West. Game on. Rugby season is back and Lifestyle Sports is giving you the chance to win something very special. The ultimate rugby year for you and three mates. You could be headed to the Champions Cup final. The Pro 14 final. Interprovincial games of your choice. And get match day ready with kit bags full of jerseys. New season training gear. 400 euro in vouchers and more. Check out LifestyleSports.com. Lifestyle Sports Rugby on Insta. Or buy any jersey in store or online for a chance to win. Live rugby with Lifestyle Sports. OTB AM When the ball goes back to him in the final are you thinking he'll, he'll get this? No doubts <laughs> <laughs> I promise you I'm shouting no No? No I'm shouting no because I mean, we, the drop goal routine is something you know if you can do a drop goal in the first minute you don't have to wait till the last minute of the World Cup final and the whole idea of it we're, we're trying to drive the, the ball under the posts we're trying to go you can't miss uh, he'd only missed two or three, so he hadn't got one yet. Um, and um, we'd, we'd got 30 yards out, and I'm just going, no, meaning go further. Just hit Johnson, hit Dalaric, keep, keep going, because they're spreading. They know the drop goal's coming in. And the problem is, at the time I'm going, no, thinking get closer, and then comes back to Johnny on his wrong foot, sails over, so I'm going, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Clive Woodward at our uh, Heineken Roadshow in Limerick during the week. You can check out that uh, full piece up and off the ball.com. And a reminder as well that the Ball Sports World Grand Prix of Darts returns to the City West Convention Centre from the 6th to the uh, 12th of October. All this week on OTB AM, all with thanks to the PDC, we're giving you the chance to win the ultimate darting experience. Uh, you and a guest are going to win a couple of VIP tickets to the Ball Sports World Grand Prix final and a night stay at the City West Hotel including breakfast on the Saturday. And we're also giving a pair of tickets to Friday's semi-final away uh, each morning this week and two steps to enter the competition. Uh, one, share the OTB AM. Sure, share OTB AM, whatever it is that you're watching or listening. And number two, uh, just tell us who the 2015 World Grand Prix, who won the 2015 World Grand Prix of Darts and uh, tickets as well. If you miss out on that competition, can be purchased at Ticketmaster.ie. Just search darts. Phil Egan, massive darts fan. Good yeah, morning to you. I would certainly be standing up. You know the way they say, stand up if you love the darts. Right. You're, I would definitely stand up. And I would demand that people around me stand up as well. Are you on one of those long tables down towards the front row? No, it doesn't really matter where. Are you yeah. giving them the high five when they're walking by? I think if he's asking, is he, made, are you on the lash? That's the. Is that the? No, I'm saying? just wondering, is he like? Are there darts aficionados who are sitting up the front of the darts at City West or at the Alley Pally, going, Jesus Christ, I <laughs> wish they'd just keep it down. There. <laughs> <laughs> I think those days are gone. I think those days are long gone. I can remember watching the the BDO. At, um, where you can actually do that sit uh, and enjoy the dancing the side where the crowd would be told to pipe down right order uh, you know give the players order. some yeah but uh, certainly that's all gone out the window 17 <laughs> yeah you can imagine this lad at the dance and everyone's gone mad <laughs> Jesus Christ <laughs> just want to watch <laughs> trying to figure out the technique I wonder how the players actually adapted to that where eventually they had to just realise I wonder if they did, did, did it in different sports like imagine if they did it in golf where it was just like just accepted that you could mm. cheer and roar I think Barney Raymond Van Barneveld put earplugs in right. to try and drown You're it better out. off embracing it though, aren't you? Like most to... sports people would talk, have, when they talk about this, uh, like they have an ability to block out the crowd. But darts is such a different <laughs> type of sport than yeah. a collision sport like football or rugby. That, like, such concentration is required. Mm. Like, the one little, like, do they practice with But then you see incredibly incredibly loud music? you'd be better off if you had a lot of noise behind mm. you, then you're not going to get distracted That's why by it. practice in the pub. 
right. in a busy pub. That's why people go play darts in yeah. the pub. Is that what you <laughs> prepare themselves mentally <laughs> first to get to the why very top. Yeah. Darts was ever thinking of, I didn't know that, Phil. Yeah, Thanks absolutely. for the information. Yeah. Right, you're going to kick us off with Scotland team news, I think. Yeah, well, I think at this stage we've all heard the Irish team, but I suppose if anyone's just tuning in, the big talking points are Jordan Larmer is going to start a full back, Andrew Conway starts on the wing, and Josh van der Fleer is in the back row. They're really the the, the main talking points from the team selection and the other talking point is the players that aren't in the match day 23 Rob Kearney Keith Earls and Joey Carby so Jack Carthy and Luke McGrath are the backup out half or uh, halfbacks even the Scotland team scrum half Greg Laidlaw will start he's got the nod over Ali Price 10 changes from the team that beat Georgia two weeks ago Duncan Taylor and Sam Johnson will start together for only the second time in the centre Finn Russell's at out half Stuart Hogg is named at full back Stuart McNally will captain the team from the front row we'll have Alan Dell and Willem Nell on either side and Sean Maitland and Tommy Seymour are on the wings England are also in action on Sunday their game is after the Ireland Scotland game they play Tonga at a quarter past 11 George Ford will start at fly half so Owen Farrell the captain will be at inside centre Farrell is uh, or sorry Ben Youngs the scrum half is going to win his 90th cap Tom Curry is named the blind side Sam Underhill at open side for that game and the World Cup obviously kicks off in Tokyo today 11.45 Irish time a game in Ireland's pool hosts Japan against Russia. Russia, captained by a former Blackrock College player. They infiltrate everywhere, don't they? Yeah. Vasily Artemio. The Russians. <laughs> That's I just remember worse. I can remember when he was... Who cares less about climate change? When he was brought in, I can remember the, the rumours going around the, the school scene at the time that Blackrock had this unbelievable Russian lad playing on the mm. wing. And he had a pretty there decent career. Played for Northampton. Uh, Jimmy McCullough has been in touch on um, the Twitter machine here, and he says, "Jesus, Nathan is seriously negative. Am I the only Irishman who thinks we're going to win the Rugby World Cup? We've beaten all the major sides over the past two years, and for once, have serious depth." Jimmy, I concur with Where's every, the serious single, depth? every single word you've said there. Serious depth. Where is the serious depth? Point number one and point number even one above that. I, well, I Nathan can is go along with negative. that. I'm on board. Is this the first time you've met me? <laughs> <laughs> you think we're going to win it? Why not? Why not, Phil? Um, because you said Africa or New Zealand. Listen, we, you know, get past one of those in the quarterfinals. Most opportune Hold on to the green jersey, Phil. Most opportune time to be playing New Zealand or South Africa. We beat one of those that are absolute favourites to win the World Cup and suddenly we're pretty much on the nose. But then we didn't play the semi-final, so... <laughs> yeah. Job done. Sounds easy enough. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> There was Europa League action last night. 17-year-old Mason Greenwood scored his first senior goal as Manchester United beat Astana 1-0 at Old Trafford. He scored the goal 17 minutes from time. Elsewhere last night, Arsenal won 3-0 away to Eintracht Frankfurt. Joe Willock, Bukayo Saka, the teenager, and Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang with the goals for the Gunners. Rangers beat Feyenoord 1-0 at Ibrox on loan. Striker from Liverpool, Shea Ojo, with the only goal of the game. Celtic drew one all the way to Rennes. Ryan Christie scored a second half penalty for Celtic after Neil Lennon's side had conceded a penalty of their own in the first half and Wolves were beaten 1-0 by Braga at Molyneux tonight in the Premier League Southampton play Bournemouth in the SSE or Tristity League Premier Division Dundalk the champions can move one step closer to retaining their league title they're away to Waterford second place Shamrock Rovers host St Pat's at Tallis Stadium Cork City are at Hampton Finn Harps Derry City face Bohemians and it's UCD against Liger Rovers and in Golf Open champion Shane Lowry is the best place Irishman on level par heading into the second round at the BMW PGA Championship at Wentworth he played with Rory McIlroy yesterday McIlroy was three under after five Wheels came off after the eighth hole. He will resume on four over. He dropped five shots in his last six holes. Double bogeyed the 17th, which is a par five. Took a bogey on the par five 18th and had to hold a 20 footer just to do that. Had to reload on the 18th. So Your he's boy, falling apart. Probably going to have to shoot, what are you thinking, five under today to make the cut? Ah, yeah, at least. Well Could capable, though. Didn't do any. Won at this course before. Uh, finished second last year. share about Rory McIlroy after he's a bad first day. Oh, oh yeah. Nobody better to have had a bad first day. He could shoot 75 under par today. He didn't <laughs> do any post round stuff yesterday. Right. Just kind he's of. He's in the habit of doing that now on occasion, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's becoming more. 
he might be better off doing less media in general. Yeah. Uh, he's generally very open and honest and gets himself in love a that. bit of a tangle. Just to let you know, Matt Wallace from England leads on seven under, Porrick Harrington one over, Paul Dunn eight over. Thanks many for that. So what's the big grand plan for the weekend, Nathan? You'll be... Grand plan. Hey, We're going out obviously. tonight, lads. Yeah. So then we'll, as a... Uh, Whiskey a tasting at five o'clock. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> As we've now entered the stage of our life, the hangover from that will probably last all weekend. It's true. On air tomorrow, 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock, Rugby World Cup preview panel. Johnny and Dan will be in the studio, Gary Breen as well, talking through who's the day's Who's on the panel? Lots of great people. Great, great. Super tremendous great. people. The best people. Yeah. The best people. I can well imagine. The very best people are going to be on that panel. Top, top people. Yeah, you great. get that. Owen's been chatting to Ali Kellogg. He is just all right. told me that is going to be on tomorrow as well. And then Sunday we have West Ham against Manchester United. Step away from those newspapers. Uh, West Ham ago. against Manchester United and it's Chelsea okay, against yeah. Liverpool. And we'll obviously be reacting to Ireland against Scotland. We'll be rea reactioning. Reactioning. <laughs> we'll have reactioning. <laughs> uh, we'll have some top, top people on that as well. I can't... So, we have um, too many top people. I can't even begin to describe what a pleasure it's been to have spent the last two and a half hours in your <laughs> company. Your demeanour suggests otherwise. No, well, anyways, Kilban is in next week. So, I'm shafted. We don't know. We don't know exactly... I mean, he says he is... We, sh we shall see what happens. Um, that's pretty much it from us uh, for this morning. Uh, I want to let you know that Michael Conway has correctly told us that Robert Thornton uh, won the 2015 World Grand Prix of Darts and he is our final semi-final uh, winner and we'll be announcing the winner of that overall prize before lunchtime, so keep an eye on the Off The Ball uh, Twitter account and keep an eye, an ear, of course, on OTB Sports Radio across the day. There's going to be uh, Friday Night Racing a little bit later on. Is that Mayo legend, Mickey Conroy? Is that Mayo Mick? No, Mayo legend. One of our great forwards right. of recent is times. It? No, I think, okay. um, yeah, I'm assuming not. Three o'clock oh, is uh, Friday Night Racing. Not Conroy. Seven, a uh, seven, <laughs> <laughs> seven, <laughs> seven o'clock tonight as always. For We're off air now, right? Off, well, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so enjoy the weekend. Best of luck to Ireland on uh, Sunday morning. We'll be picking through. Uh, Neil is going to be live on all the off-the-ball social channels as well at full time in that match to bring you all the very latest reaction of the company of Andy Dunn. It will be the only place to get your post-match reaction, so do tune in uh, post-Ireland-Scotland on Sunday morning and then live on the air as well from 1 o'clock. What are you grinning about? Nothing, nothing. Good job, Adrian. Well done today. Thanks a million. Been a pleasure. Your sarcasm knows no bounds. That's it from us for this morning. Good morning. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio.